going to ask each of you <clears throat> Colleagues, good day. Uh, welcome to this uh, first meeting of the Independent Science Advisory Group on COVID-19 uh, and the epidemic. Um, I am simply now going to, having welcomed you, ask each of you to give your name and your affiliation. We don't all know each other and it would be good to, to meet up in that way. And I'm going to start with Anthony. Hi, I'm Anthony Costa. I'm a professor of global health at UCL and I was previously at the World Health Organization. Dean Ant. Uh, Dean and Pele, a professor of virology at University College London. Carl. I'm Carl Friston. I'm a professor of neuroscience at University College London. Susan. Susan Mickey, professor of health psychology, also from University College London. Alison. I'm Alison Pollock, uh, Professor of Public Health at Newcastle University. I've got two Alisons, Alison Pittard. I'm Dr. Alison Pittard. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine. I'm also a consultant in anaesthesia and intensive care. Zubeda. I'm Dr. Zubeda Hack, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Run Me Trust. And Martin. Martin McKee, Professor of European Public Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Gabriel Scali. Gabriel Scali, public health doctor and current president of the epidemiology and public health section of the Royal Society of Medicine. And Christina. Uh, Christina, you're on mute. Okay. Kamlesh, welcome. Could you introduce yourself and give us your affiliation? Thanks. Uh, Kamlesh Kinti, professor of primary care diabetes and vascular medicine, University of Leicester. Hello. Uh, I think we've almost done it. Um, we've lost uh, Christina Pagel, and um, she is a mathematician and professor of operational research at UCL. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that she'll come on shortly. Uh, so I think the, the object of the exercise is that we are going to discuss the pandemic from where we are today out forward to the point where effectively we've got rid of the virus in the UK and have lifted the lockdown. Uh, so we're not doing an, a reanalysis of where we've got to so far, except insofar as it impacts on how we get out of it. We're certainly not here to analyze the decisions that were made. Um, as we move forward out of the pandemic, of course, the first thing is going to be to look at the, the business of getting out of the lockdown. And that is the first item on the agenda. And as I look at the group of experts I have here, I'm going to ask you to raise a hand when you want to come in, but I will also call on experts who I think should comment. And I think Carl Friston, maybe you would like to come in on this one first. Thank you. Um... So I'm coming at this from the perspective of modeling. And I think by and large, the modeling just endorses common sense or at least consensus that we see in the media. One thing though that it does bring to the table is a quantitative sense of what might happen and the mechanics and the different processes involved. And the thing that I've taken from what I've read and indeed our own modeling is a distinction between the short term and the long term. And I think this speaks to um, a distinction that I know Anthony wants to speak to, which is the, the difference between strategies of the sort exemplified by WHO. And what I would 
phrase as more policies um, currently being considered by Her Majesty's government. And the, the difference I think is important in relation to the short and the long term, exactly as, as, as you were sort of um, framing the problem. So from the point of view of the modeling, there seems to be two different kinds of second waves. The first wave could be better thought of as a flare up or a rebound that is an integral part of the current outbreak that we're witnessing. And then there's a longer term in say several months, potential for a classic second wave of the sort we saw uh, say in the 1918 Spanish flu. And the mechanisms seem very, very different. So the, the first, the rebound, the flare up that could confront us within the next few weeks seems to be very sensitive to social distancing and lockdown policies. Whereas the mechanism behind the second wave proper, say in the autumn, seems to be much more related to the loss of immunity. And in turn, that will depend very much more on strategic approaches to suppression that in turn depend upon tracing and tracking and other strategic tools that we have at hand. So from my perspective, if one wanted to model the consequences of any moves that we make, it would be very useful to, par to partition or separate considerations of current policies in relation to lockdown and social distancing, our behavior as it gets into the game and influences the epidemiology at hand and the longer term strategic responses that rest upon uh, the um, suppression and potential um, elimination to a certain extent of, of the virus. So practically what I would like to hear more about is if there is an explicit distinction between policies that can be articulated in quantitative terms, say for example, um, we will move from an amber to a red form of social distancing when the estimated prevalence of infection in the population is 3%. So hard, crisp, clear operational policies that we can all witness and indeed possibly even broadcast after the weather forecast on the news every night so that as a community we know exactly quantitatively where we're going and how those policies are being enacted. If that were possible that would be extremely useful from the modeling point of view because we can then make forecasts again very much like a weather forecast. You know, forecasting five, ten days into the future, preparing like we would do for floods or um, adverse weather events so we know what's coming and we all know why the government is doing that. So that's a discussion I think about policies and I think there are lots of concrete and simple things that one can offer um, to articulate those policies that are predicated on the modelling. And then the other discussion I think is about strategy. You know, uh, to what extent is it going to be necessary to do testing and tracking and how will that um, leverage the opportunity, the window of opportunity that we have over the forthcoming months where there are sufficiently low numbers of cases out there for tracing and tracking to actually work and to defer or indeed even actually eliminate the second wave under the assumption that a vaccine comes online within 12 to 18 months. So from my point of view, the, the, those are sort of the, you know, the, the pragmatic issues at hand. Um, and I repeat, it's, it's, a, it's a somewhat sort of technical point of view in the sense that knowing what is going to happen, having well-defined policies is incredibly useful for the modeling, which in turn is incredibly useful for sharing with people and resolving their uncertainty, or at least quantifying their uncertainty about what might happen to us you know, over the next days or weeks. Well, thank you very much, Carl. That's a, a great introduction. I, I think the, the question of testing and tracking is something we should come back to in a moment and discuss in more detail, perhaps. Uh, the, the other points you raise are, are very important, I think, in particular, the one about uh, broadcasting the state of play uh, with the weather, perhaps every evening. I, I think these, these are critically important parts of bringing a pandemic under control and being open and honest with the public as you do this so that you're taking them along with you and you're, you're getting their trust. I think the, 
the division as well we need to bear in mind between short and long term that you've raised um, and of course most of us are aware of the fact that if, as we move towards lockdown at every stage we want to see that the r0 for this uh, epidemic is kept well below one otherwise we're going to prolong the uh, the outbreak one of the factors i think we need to over overall take into account is i believe this group should be showing how could we can emerge as quickly as possible from this virus and how we can also manage to keep the death rate down right these to me are the two priorities and neither of those priorities clashes with the economic requirement because the sooner we're out of this the sooner we can get economic recovery underway now i i'm just wondering whether it would be useful to bring elias in at this point i'm turning to the producer to see if he's ready to uh, give us the recording from elias uh, is Zach is the producer there? Bear with us. Let when the virus first emerged, okay, the I, Greek I can system continue with the discussion until you come back and let me know. And we have so, been overwhelmed. So, had we Anthony, not taken would you like to early to comment and on the, the business of ending the lockdown? Um, well, could I just ask um, Carl a question first? Because mm -hmm. clearly there are just, just, um, uh, there are a number of things that get quite confused. So the first is in this first phase of the epidemic, how many people have been effectively susceptible or exposed? And I know you've done some modeling on that. And then of course we want to know of those, what percentage have probably been infected? And then of those that are infected, we obviously want to know how many of them have become immune and for how long which you probably can't answer. And then of course, we want to know which, what percentage of those that have been infected have actually died. And I've got some figures that I could show, just the latest from Johns Hopkins actually about cases and, and deaths in the UK. But I wondered if you wanted to just answer, because I know your model came up with a, a figure for uh, you know, the effective susceptible population. Yeah. And that's an excellent question and also speaks to, you know, the, the framing of what we're going to do in terms of minimising deaths uh, uh, but coming out of lockdown as quickly and as gracefully as possible. The um, sort of intuitively one can frame the immediate issue as how would a fireman respond to a fire and um, there are two sort of scenarios one can consider that you know, you think you put the fire out and the firemen go home and yet there are little embers that will flare up again if they leave prematurely so this would be the flare up analogy that's one way of looking at it in fact the maths doesn't quite look like that it looks as if we've actually witnessed a firework or an explosion um, and all that can be burned has been burned um, in the sense that um, if the potential for a flare-up is there, then it would require a certain proportion of the population to be susceptible and to be able to be infected. So it crucially depends, that sort of divide between are we dealing with a fire that has been partially put out and we have to keep on returning and quashing the embers to prevent a second flare-up, or have we actually witnessed what has happened and now we have we have entered this window of opportunity where the explosion has happened and there's going to be now a replenishing of combustible material as we lose immunity so that in say five six twelve months time depending upon the rate at which we lose immunity there is sufficient stuff for the latent virus or the you know the latent embers to reignite again in several months so that says that uh, that, that explain poses... why you think we're going to lose immunity and where that data comes from could you explain the evidence base for losing immunity and yep. why we wouldn't completely have residual immunity and also some of the papers and data where that come from 
Right. So my reading of this is that you know there is no evidence uh, um, at the present time. Of course, that that's of you know it's almost self-evident. We have to wait to see what happens. So I think what what one can say definitively that should be a prime focus of the strategy. So, but just to sort of back up a little bit, I'm uh, you know uh, coming back to Anthony's question and, and the key question is, so there are two key issues: how much immunity has already been inherited from the, the first wave that we've established. And we don't know that, and we really do need to know that, or you know, to put it sort of more practically, I would need to know those numbers in order to answer Anthony's question to, uh, to, to, to address uh, Dave's question. Um, so that's what we need to know, which puts real pressure on the um, antibody testing, the serological testing, and much less pressure on the um, um, on identifying those people who have been currently um, infected using, say, buccal swabs. So that's yeah, that 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 seems to be very very important. That you know, um, if there are now coming online antibody tests that have high specificity and sensitivity, we really need to get the the data from those to answer the first question: How much immunity have we inherited? And then the next question, which is implicit in Anthony's um, question, was. <laughs> Um, to what it, to what proportion of the of the population are players? How relevant are they? So we talk about susceptible people, which implies has to be the case there are non-susceptible people. So we need to know how many uh, uh, people, what proportion of the population, have host factors that render them not susceptible, and that means, in in turn, that specifies the level of herd immunity that would preclude any further flare-up. So all of these things need to be known um, now, stat. Um, we don't know them now, but in principle, if one could get, say, 5,000 randomly uh, sampled people from the population uh, um, tested with antibodies, I think we'd have a very, very good handle on that. So everybody, from my perspective, is waiting for that. Uh, but there are studies now on seroprevalence and immunity in California and in Iran and other countries, which is also suggesting the infection fatality rate shows much lower than we were thinking. So are those studies being added in that actually there's a much higher prevalence of infection than we thought? And that means that there's a much lower infection uh, death rate, fatality ratio than we thought. Yeah, absolutely. These data are very provisional and if you, um... I don't personally, but I have friends in California who follow the Twitter feeds and, and the debates. So the, the, these early data are, um, they're provisional, they're the kind of data we need and they're used as to showcase you know, the importance, in fact, people's reaction to these data, uh, highlight the importance of just knowing those numbers. The prov if the current data coming out of Santa Clara or indeed New, you know, there's an in a good study in New York, we're waiting for data from, from um, studies in Munich. If the trend that these data point to is correct, then you, uh, you know, the, the, um, the numbers suggest that there's much greater herd immunity, and perhaps we should demystify herd immunity, we just mean the number of people who have had it and are less likely to experience symptoms if they're exposed again in the next few weeks. So how many people have actually had the infection? whether or not they've had symptoms. And it looks as though it may be much, much greater than you, than, than you need. Um, say it was 30%. Now, if half the population was resistant, so that the effective of the susceptible population size um, um, was half of the, say, the UK population, then 30% of people who have had it represents a herd immunity, which actually precludes any flare-up. It's very difficult when you model these things to actually um, produce a, a short-term second wave or a, um, a fluctuation that is a response to a premature relaxing of, of lockdown. So that's why I hope most, that's why I suspect most people are hoping the data will point, but these data need to be much more definitive. I have, I have a, a group of people who want to come in. I'm taking them in order, Alison, and then Kamlesh and then Martin. Um, I just wanted to put the lockdown into the clinical perspective because the the main reason for the government um, implementing the lockdown was to protect the NHS and particularly critical care, which, which is my area of expertise. 
And I think whatever anyone's views are, the lockdown ha has worked extremely well in terms of allowing the NHS to cope. Um, and one of the, the ways, or in fact, the only way that critical care has been able to manage the, the, the big surge in patients is by expanding our capacity and by staff uh, working above and beyond and, and other non-critical care staff helping us. And one of the concerns that we have now going forward is, yes, we've got to work out how we start to move back into a more sustainable um, way of working with the NHS is that staff health and well-being and resilience is absolutely vital and whatever we model um, and whether we're talking about an explosion or, or a fan I, I really like that that analogy um, is that there's also always going to be a backlash in terms of the number two hospital and you know um, needing contact with with care, particularly in, in critical care. Um, and so we've got to bear that they can't sustain the current level of activity indefinitely. And we need to make sure that the modelling takes um, the staff into account so that we can make sure that we can continue to treat patients going forward, both co patients. Because I think we're going to have dual streams um, so that we can make sure that both patients and staff are protected. Can I just come in with Alison before we move on? I, I think you've raised a very, very important point. In, in other countries such as Greece, they turned this on its head and they said, what, what do we need to manage to keep this uh, pandemic under control? And the conclusion was massive increase in staffing in both care systems, in hospitals, doctors, nurses, and so on, increase the capacity so that we can deliver the optimal route of control. So there, there are two ways of looking at this. One is to say, what have we got? And the other is to say, what do we need? This is an enormous crisis. What do we need seems to me a better way of looking at this. Well, in, ter in terms of, of critical care, the, the problem is, is, is without staff, we don't have critical care and doctors and nurses and all the allied health professions that make up the critical care service are highly trained and specialised. And so we can't just create them overnight. Um, I was absolutely delighted when the government um, Alison, you've frozen. In post. Oh, I've, I've frozen, sorry. Am I back in? You're back in. Yeah. Okay, so the, the government have um, have given us uh, an extra 100 training posts this year, so we, we will now be able to um, have 249 train, trainee intensive care medicine doctors join us who, who will be able to support us um, but we're not getting any more nurses. And so we, we already start off in England with a very low number of critical care beds per 100,000 population as compared to the rest of Europe. So we're not starting from a good point. We can't turn that around overnight. Um, but a, a commitment to reviewing critical care services in the longer term um, would certainly help to answer the question: What, what, you know, what have we got, and what can we do to make this sustainable? Thank you. I, I'm going to turn now to uh, Kamlesh. Um, thanks very much. Um, I, it was just a question, Carl. I, I was really surprised when you mentioned that the immunity may be limited, just like us and Pollock. So I haven't heard of that at all. Uh, uh, secondly, from some of the modelling I've looked at. Uh, I was under the impression that about 50% of the UK population may already be, have been affected. And from my limited knowledge, again, about herd immunity, I thought that was quite important that we need to get to around 80% before uh, we get to a reasonably safe level. Yes, I mean, I didn't appreciate that 50%, that was the consensus 50% of people have already been affected. If that's the case, that's, ex that's exceedingly optimistic. Um, um, so 80% of the susceptible population would guarantee 
a, um, that any flare-up was precluded. Um, if you run the numbers um, on um, the current data uh, under certain models, then it would be a, it would not be surprising that say thirty percent or twenty percent of the population was actually resistant. You know, a trivial but probably false example here would be um, say children who had a paucity of two receptors and therefore they're not in the game. So there are going to be people who are not part of the susceptible, the affected population size, which brings up 60% down to something like 50%. So I can certainly model a scenario where if we are at 50%, and indeed that is actually um, very, very close to what the, you know, these simple models would predict at this stage, then it would be extremely difficult to actually have a flare up um, under the assumption that we have these opera operationalized social distancing policies. And I think that's relevant for the, for the previous point as well, because the, um, the mechanism from the maths point of view of all of this social distancing is just to slow things down so that one can prepare more appropriately and to take pressure off the, off the, uh, the healthcare services that we've just heard about. So I think analogy here would be like a flood you know, you well. You, if you remember the floods around Christmas, there is nothing that can be done in terms of holding back the water. But what one can do is moderate and nuance and control the rate at which the, the, those waters transcend from the from the clouds to, to the sea and the damage they do en route. And I think that's the game that we where we are in. But just to conclude, if fifty percent is is the number, that that, that that's very encouraging. So, so let me just interrupt the proceedings by saying several of you clearly have an urgent thing to raise, which is very relevant to this discussion. Others may have other points to raise. I'm just wondering if you just put one finger up, maybe it's not so urgent. If you put your hand up, it's more <laughs> urgent. So Martin, you, you, you have your hand up. I, I've got Martin, Dinan and Christina in that order. And I think Anthony wants to come in as well. I really don't think we have any idea how many people have been infected. Uh, the Santa Clara study was mentioned earlier, but there are really very significant problems with that study. And uh, some people have argued that it shouldn't actually have been published, uh, given the known difficulties with it. And even if it was, it doesn't tell us anything about what's happening here. I think 50% is extremely optimistic. The figures I've seen from New York talk about 25%, where the uh, epidemic has been much more intensive. So. Um, the, I think what this highlights is that we've been focusing very much on a number of tests to be done without being clear about what we're trying to find out. And it is unfortunate that we've got to this position. The work is being done. For example, the uh, 250,000 people that are being sampled, the work that Port and Down is doing and so on, which will give us the information we need. But I still think we're flying very much in the dark on all of this. Okay, can I, can I just run through the people whose hands are waving? I'm going to, uh, Dinan, are you on this point? Uh, yeah, just a couple of very brief uh, things. Uh, first of all, I do want to warn against using terms that can quickly become used outside of scientific circles and, and just look at how herd immunity was misinterpreted and so on. So um, terms such as resistant and so forth are biological terms which which may or may not actually translate into um, <laughs> into what we see so I, I, I do want to just urge caution there um, um, and and of course what we've already said is there's a large amount of unknown and, and I think just talking car carrying on talking about different studies that are showing different levels of zero prevalence in populations <laughs> You know, we could talk forever about that, but in reality, um, uh, my sense is that um, the overriding amount of data, whatever the caveats of antibody tests that are being done around the world, is it's a relatively small proportion of individuals that have been exposed to the virus to date. That's my general feeling, but I mean, you know, we could just talk forever about that. The second thing that I just want to raise per per pertaining to modeling and, and, and so on that Carl talked talked about right at the beginning that I, I, we, we need to be careful about is thinking about vaccine. And of course, it is the mantra 
here that we need to somehow survive until a vaccine becomes available. Um, but of course, um, not only is there un uncertainty around that, but even when a vaccine becomes available, that vaccine does not infer 100% protection in everyone that is given it. it like, there's all the variables such as the the, the duration of prevention, the uptake, and so forth. So I would like to also suggest that when we're talking about how the future looks and guiding that scientifically, we're actually thinking for a long-term pandemic with ups and downs, an endemic infection that will come up and down for maybe years to come with perhaps interventions such as maybe vaccines, maybe partially uptake and, and so forth. But I, I do think we should frame things in that in that context when we're thinking about during this call and future meetings thinking about the future strategy thank you christina you've been very patient thank you um just to say that the 50 percent figure comes from the oxford modeling study which i don't think is consensus and um, where they've done um testing of, uh, around the world it's been somewhere between five and twenty percent i think twenty percent is a new york figure and if we're thinking about advising for the future and looking back at the recent surge here that we've had I think we do need to plan for a reasonable worst case so it's not kind of hoping that it's 50 percent but planning for what if it's not what if it's 50 percent what if it's 10 percent even and how do we plan for that okay and uh, Anthony can I just um I don't know if I can share my screen here can you get rid of that can you see that? No. no. I can see you. Um, can you see this? Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, rather than herd immunity, death is a slightly more measurable outcome. And this is the latest today from Johns Hopkins, just showing the step where we added in the community deaths about a week ago, but of course, uh, showing we're up towards 30,000, but the Financial Times have estimated the numbers of deaths still not counted uh, from ONS, the Office of National Statistics data, which would push us up to about 48,000 deaths. So although we have done well in terms of the NHS managing the surge, I don't think we would say we've done well in comparison to other countries uh, in terms of managing this first stage of uh, the epidemic. The second one is, is, is this. This is the um, cases, new cases um, each day. And you can see that we're still, um, now of course this is difficult to interpret because we're testing more. And therefore, it could be that it is coming down. But at the moment, we're around about 5,000 cases. And the question is, if we're going to lift the lockdown, at what level of cases would it be safe, in addition to the R0 number, that we could lift the lockdown safely? Or are we just going to see this come back fairly rapidly if there isn't that much herd immunity? But the other one I wanted to show you is this. Which uh, is Anthony? Can I, I just interrupt you? We're still on the first graph. Mm. Screen. Oh, sorry. Do I have to do so? Oh, I have to. Each one I have to share. Hang on. Well, don't worry about the set. Let's see if I can share this. Um, how do I do this? Get rid of that. Um, get rid of that. Where are you? Let's share screen and share this. Can you see that? Yep. So this is just a slide that it, it's about the mindset, really. And it, there are two ways that we can really think. And it comes back to Carl's point about short and longer term and to Deenan's point about um, this virus having many different effects. And we have to be careful about the language we use. So on the right is, is can you see that? Both of them. The yep. UK approach and the five principles so the nhs must be able to cope we should see a sustained and consistent fall in daily death rates we need manageable levels of infection have enough 
S and PPE and try and ensure, ensure we don't have a second peak. So that is a kind of, it still feels to me like a managed spread option that this is a pandemic, we can't stop it. Uh, we have to let it spread through our population, but in a managed way. And then on the left, I've got the WHO uh, principles, which read to me very differently. And it's, it, so the first is to mention the public health force, not the, it, it's all about how we can organize our public health services, particularly to train, deploy them to prevent. And that is of course our primary care people like our general practices, and we have a great system in the UK, and also how our local authority public health teams can get engaged in this, rather than a sort of centralised managed thing from, from, say, Public Health England. The second is how you've got to find every case. I mean, WHO has said this daily for the past two months, um, that, you know, you really got to go after every case. And for that, you need testing capacity and also availability so that people in communities can get access to a test rather than drive for two hours to some you know, airport. And that you need a very good isolation policy and a clear plan to quarantine the sick people, the moderately sick so that they're not passing it on, and also the contacts so that you know where you're going to put the contacts and for how long. For, is it 14 days or is it seven days, as said? So we need that. But the final thing is really important. Are we refocusing the whole of government on suppression or are we managing the spread? And I'm still not clear exactly what the UK policy is because it was very clearly managing the spread on March the 12th when we had, you know, the, we must all get it and get herd immunity and, and um, you know, um, let it let it spread through the population the herd immunity idea are we though coming back to a suppression policy and how far can we go with that uh it seems like matt hancock jeremy hunt and others are really pushing that and i'm just not quite clear where the uk government sits between these two so i think that's something for discussion yeah, anthony i think that's a very fair question if we decide to put questions to government to ask them um, I, I think I, I saw, first of all, Zubeda, and uh, secondly, uh, Gerald uh, coming in there. Zubeda. Um, I've got a slightly different question going back to the number of deaths um, in relation to COVID-19. And I think um, I'm a bit more concerned about how we're measuring things, because we've been talking entirely about just measuring deaths in relation to COVID-19 and critical illnesses in relation to COVID-19. But I've got two questions which may or may not be directly relevant. One is, is how much higher is the mortality that is unrelated to COVID-19 this year compared to last year? And I'm asking that because, because we're just measuring COVID-19 deaths, I, I want to be sure that there aren't other deaths happening because of the disproportionate focus on COVID-19? That's my first question. And my second question, I suppose, is related, which is we're saying, and, and I think, I mean, it's right to some extent that the NHS is, is coping very well, and, and that was the intention to, to a great extent, but is it just coping very well right now because we've postponed all the cancer treatments because we've postponed all the other urgent care, the surgeries. And can that be sustained in three months time and in six months time, given that this pandemic's not going to disappear in those months? Thank you very much. And I move to Gabriel. Uh, you, you are, you are, uh, Gabriel. Gabriel. I just wanted to come back to the criteria uh, for lifting lockdown, which was your question to us, Sir David. And uh, I was very struck by the difference between the six criteria as outlined by the Director General of WHO on the 13th of April and the five tests that were outlined by the government, uh, UK government, on the 17th of April. And there are quite significant differences between the two of them some of which we're going to go on to discuss other items on the agenda. Uh, but 
I do think a useful uh, thing to do would be to try and look at potential harmonization of those uh, sets of criteria uh, so that we have a practical guide that people can understand and they know exactly what sort of things we should be aiming for before lifting the restrictions or as the restrictions are gradually lifted. Um, because I do think uh, they are not necessarily uh, oppositional, but I do think they could potentially be very complementary to each other if they were melded together. Thank you. Thank you. I've, I've been asked by the producer to tell you actually there is feedback occurring. So uh, it is important, it turns out, to uh, put yourselves on mute if you're not talking. Um, I, I, I've got Christina, who is on mute, if Christina could come in. Um, just to, sorry, just to carry on from what Zubeda was saying about the importance of patients who don't have COVID. And the NHS has coped in large by just stopping most of its other activity. And I think when we come out of lockdown and having reduced the burden of COVID on the NHS, one of the key things is going to be how do we now move back to normal practice. We can't suspend that for a year. Um, a lot of the people who most need the NHS are also those who are most vulnerable to COVID. Um, so can we do some modeling? Can we think about how do we reprovision? Maybe some hospitals only treat COVID patients, some hospitals can treat other people, but that is a really key thing that we have to deal with right now. Thank you. Uh, I've got Kamlesh. And Kamlesh, you yeah. You're, yeah. Right. Thank you very much. So we're already seeing excess deaths. Uh, we saw some uh, a bleep uh, a few weeks ago from the UK data. Today I saw some data from Wales showing that there was a 30% increase in excess deaths compared to uh, comparative data from previous years adjusting for, for the time periods. There's also data from uh, that's just been published last week in uh, Italy showing that the number of people coming to hospital with heart attacks was reduced by 30%. Now what's happening, people don't have to start, stop having a heart attack during a pandemic. So it must be that the mortality is possibly occurring at home because they're not accessing uh, the uh, services. We also need to look at what happens after we're out of this, because there's been a good data uh, that's shown that after natural disasters, you get much more increased mortality further down the line because everything stopped as you've just mentioned. Uh, so we, we are not running services as we would normally, we're not doing blood tests, we're not reviewing patients and people in particular with chronic diseases such as diabetes, heart disease, cardiovascular disease. First of all, they're not having regular monitoring done. Secondly, they also are, have, have increased anxiety levels that does put them at risk. Uh, the amount of uh, adherence to medications goes down, that puts them at risk. So I think we really need to ensure that we are still supporting our patients at this time and we continue supporting them even more aggressively when they're out of this. So, so can I just come back to you, Kamlesh? This is once again the point that I was making before. So does that mean that there needs to be further investment in staff, in capabilities to manage a pandemic situation alongside keeping all those operations going? Absolutely. I think from what we've seen, the pandemic situation in terms of hospital services have been inundated, but they have done very well compared to many of the other countries. When we're out of this, mainly it's going to be primary care that's going to be hit because that's where 95% of the populations are looked after in terms of chronic diseases. And this is where we will need more staff, not just the general practitioners, but we know that people like uh, nurses, pharmacists, they can all help in terms, in terms of risk factor reduction for all those patients with chronic diseases. There's also an issue about uh, depression and anxiety levels that are going up uh, within our patients. And again, services will need to be met for those as well. Alison? Thank you. I'm going, to, I'm going to let Susan come in because she's been desperate to come in. <laughs> I haven't been desperate to come in, but I have been trying to get in for a while. Sorry, sorry, Susan. First of all, um, I'm very pleased that you've included a social and behavioural scientist um, in this group. And sorry that I have to leave uh, just before one. Right. I wanted to raise the issue of um, adherence by the population to government guidance. Um, and 
this is relevant both for modeling and I don't know what assumptions have been made in the modeling, but also about thinking about policy options. And I think people were um, very surprised at how adherent the British population have been to um, government guidance so far. And I think a lot of that has been down to the collective solidarity that has been built up as people have been rising to the challenges, which for some people in some uh, living conditions has been extremely challenging indeed. Um, going forward in terms of lifting the lockdown, um, it's going to be a very different situation because in the lockdown, um, similar measures were being carried out across the whole population by and large. But what we're going to be seeing is different measures for different sections of the population. And so this has the potential for undermining the collective solidarity that's been so important for, for trust, for adherence, uh, for helping each other. And if it's not handled well, risks potential uh, division between groups, um, risks perceived uh, inequality and injustice and unfairness, which can lead to resentment and anger and um, people getting alienated from um, the collective and from what's being asked of them. So I think really a lot of thought has to be given to how this is going to be managed and managed in such a way that all sections of the population are being looked after and their needs are being met. Um, because in the lockdown, as we know, um, the measures meant that those who were already disadvantaged were even more disadvantaged. So an already unequal society has become more unequal. And this has potential to be even greater um, along many different lines of disadvantage in the society. Uh, so um, I'm raising this um, not just in relation to um, maximizing the rate at which we can um, stop transmission and um, drive the pandemic out, but also in the context of what kind of society uh, will we be left with as we come out of uh, the pandemic. I've, I've got Alison Pittard waiting to come in, but just if I could come back to you, Susan, what, what would the key recommendations be to, to manage what you've just said? I think we're all concerned about it. Can you just help us to put in some recommendations there? I think um, one will be ensuring um, financial security of everybody when there's very differential access to going back to incomes and kinds of financial loss. And although um, a lot of measures have been put in place, there are still, still many millions uh, who are facing financial insecurity. Um, and for example, if we're expecting people to isolate in terms of the contact tracing, uh, those people need to have financial security. So there's a material basis. Um, there's also an issue about um, messaging. Um, different groups of people will need to be um, thought about very differently in terms of the kind of messages that will help to mobilize um, really commitment uh, to keeping going and adhering to what will continue to, to be um, difficult issues. And I think the third thing is about uh, paying more attention to community. Communities have been very impressive, the way they've come together, incredible um, examples of people helping each other and uh, strengthening communities. But this needs to be kept going and communities need to be mobilized even more intensely for the longer term um, if the cohesiveness is to be ret retained. So I'd say three things. One is um, the material basis of, of um, ensuring that people's needs are being met. Secondly, much more nuanced messaging, uh, for example, about the over rather than under 70 year olds. And thirdly, uh, much more bottom up community orientated strategy, which requires rebuilding quite a bit of the infrastructure that has been lost over the last 10 years. That's very helpful. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Alison Pittard, and then I'm going to Zubeda. So I just wanted to come back on um, what Kamlesh was, was, was saying, T two things that, um, yes, we, we will need, well, we, ideally we'd have more staff and certainly within, as I said before, critical care, 
one of the ways that we have managed is by our critical care teams being supported by non-critical care staff because they've not been doing their normal routine work that's been put on hold um, during the pandemic. But as they move back to try and get business back to usual or some semblance of, of normality, that support is going to, um, to reduce. So I think we need to look at what we can deliver a sustainable model um, rather than put, put services and, and have to pressure. But one, one of the things that, that we could do is look at more efficient models of delivering how we were before. Um, one example of, of that is, is that the, the faculty um, is about to publish some guidance on a different model of care, looking at the gap between ward and critical care, because we know some patients who don't need critical care have to go there because they can't be managed on a ward, either because they're that little bit sicker than the ward can, can deal with or they need more interventions. And so by moving staff around and creating services to look after these people, it frees up capacity. The other thing that, that we could do to free up capacity in, um, in secondary care or in acute hospital settings is to look at what happens to patients when they've been critically ill. And this is COVID and non-COVID patients. It, it can take 12 to 18 months to get over being critically ill, irrespective of what brings you into hospital. And that's not only physical, but that's psychological um, um, problems as well. And many patients will stay in secondary care longer than is required because they don't have adequate support outside in primary care. And that's from physiotherapy, that psychological support, oh, the whole rehabilitation and life after critical illness. And again, that's a work stream that the faculty had already started on in, um, in July. And we're going to um, publish a provisional statement. Uh, uh, Alison, you're frozen. Again, can you tell me when it when it ever come back at all? We can hear you now, yes. Okay, so that perhaps if we're going to look at investing in anywhere, it's investing in new models or new services, utilizing staff that we already have because they're the thing lies much more quickly and actually have an impact. Um, you know, more more quickly than trying to, to develop more new staff. Thank you. And Zubeda? And I'll um, give it to you, Alison Pollock, after this. Thank you for that, Alison. Um, I think I really want to echo what, what um, Susan has been saying about how during COVID-19 and after COVID-19, we have to pay much more attention to how COVID-19 has brought into sharp relief the racial inequalities as well as the socio-economic um, inequalities that have existed and they have brought them into sharp relief and to some extent uh, to, or to a great extent arguably they um, might explain some of the disproportionate COVID-19 critical illness figures as well as death among ethnic minority groups but I want to particularly bring in that point that Susan raised about in terms of recommendations what the government needs to be thinking about. As Susan's absolutely right, the government has focused, and to a great extent, you know, understandably, on employees as well as self-employed, but there is a vast number of people within the labour market that fall in between those areas. We've already got some anecdotal data at Run Me Trust from surveys that ethnic minorities have been disproportionately economically hit by COVID-19. Now, the other aspect of ethnic minorities is while they're a heterogeneous, heterogeneous group, um, generally speaking, they are at the lower end of the poverty spectrum. They're much more likely to be poor and much more likely to be in insecure um, jobs, um, in precarious jobs, and they're much more likely to live in poor condition and overcrowded housing. Now, what that means right now is if those people are at the brink of poverty or have lost jobs, do they have a sufficient safety net 
at the moment, an economic safety net. And the anecdotal evidence at the moment is they haven't, that government hasn't really considered them. Um, we also know at Run and Me Trust, having worked with um, the Women's Budget Group, we're having worked with um, JCWI, the Joint Council for Welfare of Immigrants and so on, that there are immigrant groups, um, migrant groups, that there are women's groups, and then there are ethnic minorities who are not able to access universal credit, either because there's no recourse to public funds or that they are able to access universal credit, but because of the way universal credit benefits are at the moment, um, because of the benefit caps, because of the five week um, wait to, to access benefits, because of the two child policy limit, which means that bigger families, um, which are disproportionately among ethnic minority families, they can't get enough money. And so what this means in terms of COVID-19 is the question for those people, are they being forced into work? Are they, having, are they being forced into work? And are they having to break down social, are they having to sort of, um, sorry, go against social distancing policies? Because for them, it means that they, you know, it, for them, it's a choice of not having enough food or to put food on the table or not. Thank you very much. Um, I think I've got Alison Pollock now. Um, thank you. Um, just to build on what Susan and Sebeda were saying, um, Philip Alston, the US, uh, UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, and more recently Michael Marmot, has drawn, have drawn attention to the extraordinary and growing and widening inequalities and poverty that are going on. And the fact that we're approaching 40% of our children living below the poverty line, so yes. children in particular, have been badly affected as well in this lockdown by being denied a right to education. And education is much more, school is much more just than about education. Mm. So in a way, COVID has shone a, a spotlight on these growing and widening inequalities. And much of the discourse is neglected, as you and Susan rightly say, the, the most vulnerable in society. We're all vulnerable, but they're really, truly vulnerable in society. Um, and I think we should be picking this up and, um, you know, referencing Michael Marmot and Philip Alston, because unless we tackle this with a systematic plan, we're not going to get very far. And we'll just see what could happen as after 2008 is a continuing widening of the inequalities and poverty because of austerity. And that leads me really into two points that I want to make with reference to the previous conversation. One is we know that COVID and the lockdown has had great collateral damage, particularly on older people, vulnerable groups, children with learning difficulties and, and people with disabilities. And we see the tip of the iceberg in the excess deaths. I do think it's a great pity that the government uses the daily death toll you know, the death counts and the testing counts as a propaganda tool, because these data are unreliable when they're reported daily, they're inaccurate and they're under-reporting all the other excess deaths. And really they should have the official statisticians, the Office of National Statistics do a great job, very rigorous, and they should be reporting once a week or once a fortnight. We don't need this daily death toll. It's being used as a propaganda tool mm -hmm. and the testing data are inaccurate and incoherent. So I just want to make this point for the public that it's really important that we understand where the official statistics are, where they're gathered and how they can be misused by government. Um, but the second point I think relates to the whole issue again around the excess deaths is what are the, what's the collateral damage of COVID? And uh, in the NHS, we know we were told we were to protect the NHS. Well, all of my life, I've been told the NHS was there to protect me. So this is an extraordinary position to put me into, that I've got to protect the NHS and I've got to stay at home to protect, save lives. And of course, the reason why we're in this position is because for 30 years, we've had a decimation of public services and especially the NHS with marketization, privatization, foundation trusts that can now generate up to half their income from private patients, 
and a whole diversion of money through the private finance initiative and the contracting and commissioning. And yet the government has been able to stop contracting and commissioning just like that when it wanted to, because it could see it was inefficient. So really the government needs to revisit its public sector policies. And we focused a lot on hospitals and ITUs, which is right. But we need to focus on all the other parts, the bits that have stopped, the community mental health services, the community health services, and above all, the 400,000 people who are in nursing homes who have been completely left outside of the system. And this is an opportunity for a really radical relook at why public services are matter. We, the government should be putting its hand up and saying why it's got it wrong, where it's got it wrong, and why we need to rebuild it and not continue the policy of privatizing and contracting out. Um, and that will also mean that we've got to look at an employment strategy and an industrial strategy and thinking about how we're going to redeploy staff who are furloughed and unemployed and really build up the sectors that need it. Much, many of the deaths in the nursing homes were preventable and avoidable. And people dying alone without relatives is inhumane and barbaric. But not only that, we could have put in many more staffing if the government had decided to requisition those homes early. It could have doubled the nursing staff and tripled them, and it could have redeployed, redeployed staff from quiet bits of the NHS. So I think what I'm saying is that really um, the other part of the system that we will be coming to is the whole carving out and loss of the local community, which is what Susan's been talking about. Local government is really reduced to a, a bin service and a contracting out service. Local government needs to be empowered and enhanced so it can take on the public health roles, the educational roles, the things that have been decimated and destroyed with billions of pounds worth of cuts over the last uh, 10, 20 years. And we really need to rebuild that. If we are serious about the community and community involvement, we need to rebuild that capacity that includes the public health capacity for contact tracing. And I'm really worried that the government's solution now is centralizing and privatizing with the news that Circo is going to run the contact tracing centers, with the news that we've got Deloitte's running testing ser uh, services, this is extremely worrying. The government needs to wake up and realize the value and the importance of public services and public ownership and public control. And I'm sorry I'm going on about this, but we are not, we are in this position. The, the lockdown has been necessitated because we actually decimated our public services. So we limited our options and choices, which is why we are where we are now. Thank you, Alison. I, uh, I'm going to, oh, we, we've now lost one of our people. I was going to turn to her and ask her if she had comments before she had to go. So I'm, I'm going to go back in order of hands that I saw going up. Next is, uh, gosh, it's you've all moved now on my screen. It's very confusing. I was getting used to where I could find you. Uh, where's Gabriel? Hi. There you, I... Yes. Thank you. Uh, just one point about the data. Alison made a good point about data here. And uh, I'm sure, like many people, I have found some of the data and the publicly quoted data quite confusing at times. And uh, what is interesting is the variation around the UK as, as well. Um, I've been looking particularly at the Northern Ireland data, and there was uh, someone talked about the excess mortality. Uh, issue earlier, and I, I think that's a, an extremely important issue uh, and one of the key sets of statistics. Uh, for example, in the, the last week's data that was made available in Northern Ireland, uh, comparing that particular week, which was the week I, I think to the 24th of April, uh, that uh, the mortality had increased by 65% over the average of the previous five years. Uh, and only a, a proportion of those, uh, a limited proportion, were actually deaths registered with COVID, uh, and an even smaller proportion of those were the deaths as declared by the Department of Health. So there is a real issue, I think, about the data, and uh, I think some recommendations about the data set would be very, very useful, and particularly taking into account uh, the disparity that there is in data sets between uh, the countries of the European community and, and the UK, in terms of what is included in data, I don't think uh, 
uh, these are, are satisfactory. And I do know that uh, uh, the UK Statistics Authority had occasion last week to re, uh, write in extremely strong terms uh, to the Department of Health in Northern Ireland uh, about their poor performance in statistics, although some of the other agencies in Northern Ireland have done well. But I was wondering, Sir David, uh, about, uh, we've been, I had a most useful discussion for just over an hour now, and uh, given the time we have left, I was wondering, were you, would you think about moving on to some of the other issues which uh, you'd given us in our uh, draft agenda? Thanks. Certainly, I'm, I'm happy to move on. I'm just going to ask the remaining two, Martin and Dean, and if you could be reasonably quick, uh, Martin. Well, well, not, uh, you know, I may have personal views on many of the issues that Alison raised, but I think it's really important to remember we are a scientific advisory group yes. and we have a problem now. There are many things that are wrong with society that we may, that we obviously will need to look at in the future. And, you know, my, our own work, my own work, uh, certainly um, shed a light, on, sh shone a light on the impact of austerity. So, you know, I, I take the points. I, uh, I accept many of those points, but we now need to actually see what do we do now to get out of this. And we've already said we've got a lot of problems with the data. I would strongly recommend that we look at age standardized excess mortality from all causes at the minute, because it's the one thing that we can be certain about. And when we look at the European comparative data, which we can get from the Euromomo database, we see that England is now 40 standard deviations away from uh, where it would normally be. It's much, much higher relatively than many other uh, than any other country in Europe that is reported there. They don't actually report the data from, from every country. I think we also need to keep an eye on this. We need to have the measures that we have adopted to keep the R naught lower than one because the exponential nature of the spread means that if we just go even a tiny bit above that, then the epidemic gets out of control. And that means that we do need to, to have the lockdown. We need to have the restrictions in place. Now, of course, as Susan has said, um, and uh, Zabeda has said, we also need to accompany that with measures that will mitigate the impact on vulnerable groups. And we need to recognize that the burden falls disproportionately on some than others. We have data from New York, for example, showing that people in more affluent areas are much more likely to be able to work from home than those in poorer areas. But I, I think we need to be clear, but we, we need to focus on what we can actually do now, which to my mind has to start off with getting much, much better data. Because at the minute we have problems with data on mortality, problems with data on seroprevalence, problems on data with the incidence of you know, the cases and so on. And you know, we're quite a long way in now to still be having all these questions where we're discussing what is the prevalent, the seroprevalence in the community. I think we've now touched on a very important recommendation, which is raising the quality and level of the data. But I, I think it would be useful if perhaps several of you could get together and produce a short paper on that, just as advice to go through. Um, I've got Dinan next. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Dave. I, briefly, before I get to my main point, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, what Martin and others have said. Um, with regard to the paucity and inadequacy of the current data. Having said that, we are only three to four months from the discovery of this virus. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it, you know, for most, most infections, it takes many, many years of many different sorts of studies and follow-up studies and laboratory studies and clinical studies and ethnological studies to understand the dynamics. So, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I think we need to push for that, but, but I'm aware of a number of studies ongoing. What I wanted to do um, was to actually um, help by taking, taking the discussion into you know, a, a, uh, you know, what would be a strategy, a next strategy for as we come out of lockdown. And of course, uh, and a number of, 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 of you have talked about a whole range of things such as community-based um, um, sustainability, um, the ability to work, work, work to, to, to deal with local inequalities. Um, and I think there are three characteristics, it seems, of the next stage. Um, one is, of course, it, there needs to be a sustainability of our response in terms of the testing and tracking and contact tracing. As I said earlier, this may go on year after year. This is not just an urge uh, 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 for the now. Um, the second is 
is just focusing on diagnostics. And as a virologist, uh, I've, I've spent a fair bit of time thinking about and discussing uh, diagnostics and remembering that um, whatever one makes of the various figures that are banded around about number of tests, which of course to many of us is a meaningless um, um, uh, total, but um, we are now depending on these big um, uh, lighthouse laboratories around the UK and testing facilities. And of course, those facilities are staffed with those who are been uh, uh, have stopped working in laboratories elsewhere and so forth and machines have made it to labs from other universities and so on and as we come out of this you know i i'm very unclear about the sustainability of that and therefore there has to be the development of a local based um, um, primary care social care a locality based approach to this whole process of being able to continue to monitor infections, to, to understand and to, to, to support quarantines where it's necessary, um, and, and to deal with some of those inequalities um, that we've talked about. Um, and, and it is worrying to continually hear about the outsourcing of different functions, because I do note that when cabinet min ministers and others responsible for different areas uh, are talking about their area, whether it's testing or this, often they'll say, well, I can only talk about one thing, it's someone else's responsibility to talk about something else. And in fact, it is that integrated system that we may be in a position to start to guide, uh, evidence-based, uh, but something that really quickly needs to be embedded within our existing structures. And finally, it is just amazing that primary care has been nowhere within the discussion so far, yet of course is central to any sustainable sustainability as well as the way that um, we, we work between COVID and non-COVID but nevertheless integrated and, 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 and impactful diseases. Cam Lesh has, has, has spoken about that. Thank you. Dina, thank you again. Many points to go into our recommendations. Uh, I think I just lost track. I, uh, who was next? Christina? Uh, did you? I, think, uh, I just wanted to come in on where we go next from lockdown. And I totally agree with what people have been saying and Martin's point that we have to keep our naught below one. I think if, if our baseline number of infections is very low, you could probably have our naught reasonably close to one, if just below it. Um, we know that lockdown has worked. The latest estimate was our naught's probably around 0.7 now. And in other countries, it's come down. The question is what elements of lockdown keeping it low and this is where I think as other countries are starting to come out can we learn from each other understand what are the key components of, of suppressing it what can we live with what's sustainable people in are now kind of pressing for can we do local experiments almost to people how do we come out of lockdown in areas where COVID hasn't been as prevalent um, the only question for me there is how do you keep people local um, so how do you really say, I don't know, a certain area of, of England comes out of lockdown earlier? How do you keep people local? How do you stop people traveling between areas? Um, but certainly as different countries are trying different strategies, this is a time for us to learn from each other. Very good. Um, I've got, I think it's first Anthony and then Zubeda and then Alison P. Um, just to endorse what several people have said about the importance of the local response. Uh, as Kamlesh said, 85% of all care uh, in this country is done in primary care. And over the past two months, almost unreported, has been a total transformation of the way in which primary care is delivered. And I don't think we're going to go back to how it was delivered before. There's you know, GPs and public health services have to be delivered in a different way. And, and to be do this sustainably, we've got to focus on that. If we've got, if most people in this country are registered with a GP, and if you've got a local outbreak management team and health protection teams already in place, they should be the people delivering this. They should be the people involved in all of this. And setting up separate systems is, as Dean and said, completely unsustainable and going to lead to tremendous confusion. So I think Public Health England has got to get 
their forces, the people that they have on the ground, linking into primary care as the fundamental strategy for solving how we go forward. And just the second point I'd like to make is there was a blog by Paul Romer, the Nobel Prize winning economist, about a month ago, where he showed that um, you can solve the problem by find, test, trace, and isolate every case, because that's the most effective form of social distancing. As, as Carl has said in the past, that that is one part of social distancing, but it's the most effective because you're trying to lock down the people that you really want to lock down, which are the people with the infection or those who are their contacts who may be asymptomatic and also spreading the infection. And of course, the other two sources where R0 is probably not below one, which are hospitals and care homes. So you really need to focus down on what you want to do. And then you start to address in, in the short term, some of the problems that Zubeda and Alison and Susan were referring to, which are all the, the collateral damage, all the people in, in marginal jobs who are losing benefits, who are not getting universal credit and all the rest, because then we can get things going again. My big fear at the moment is unless, if the herd immunity is right and Carl is right, we're not going to have a big second surge and we'll be okay. But we don't know that. And until we really know that, my fear at the moment is that we're going to lift the lockdown. We're going to have too many cases around and it will quickly spread into parts of the country that it hasn't got to yet. Um, the smaller towns and whatever. And then we've only got a choice between another national lockdown, a scenario of repeat national lockdowns, which will hit the economy massively and cause mass unemployment, tip us into not a recession, but possibly a depression. So somehow we've got to get a sustainable, local, fine test and treat sit set up that will work to keep it all damped down so that we can then move on. Now, the countries like Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Greece, Denmark, and all that, that have locked it down early uh, are able it seems to kind of keep a lid on it and then we hope we get a vaccine but are we in a position where because we've let it run like italy and spain and the united states can we put the cap back on can we get it back to a fine test trace isolate quarantine and socially distance so that we can then hopefully have a, a, at least a period of stability in the economy before a vaccine comes. And that's the great dilemma. And I, I actually don't know what the answer is there. Um, and I obviously we all hope that the herd immunity and the tests are gonna show better than expected, but I share some of Deenan's concerns about that. But if I could just come in, if, if we're looking at uh, both national and global situations, how do we emerge from all of this? And this is the last point before we move on to another point. How do we emerge from this, both in Britain, but also internationally, so that we get back to something like normal, uh, international travel, etc.? And it must surely depend on uh, a detailed and quantitative process of testing and tracing so that we, we know as we remove ourselves from this pandemic, that there's no longer any virus anywhere. Now, one part of it may be if we get immunity widespread, but of course that, that is not a point to rely on. I think uh, in some countries where there's been virtually no controls, and I'm talking, for example, about Brazil, where controls have been rather sporadic, uh, it may be that it will be, lead to uh, widespread immunity but that's certainly not going to be the case everywhere. So those countries like Greece that have operated well and South Korea become vulnerable if the virus still continues elsewhere. So I think it behoves every country to ramp up testing and tracing so that finally we eliminate the virus completely. We, we can go to an R0 number that takes us constantly towards zero. But to get to zero, we, we actually need uh, testing and tracing. Isn't that a, a given? Can we get back to uh, complete elimination? I don't think people are arguing that you can totally eliminate this virus now. 
Is, is that correct? Maybe Deenan would know. I mean, certainly that's what some of the modelers feeding into Sage would say, uh, that you know you can only eliminate it right? or, or you have to live with it, with a vaccine or, or whatever, that to get rid of it entirely across a global pandemic is probably impossible, but you can damp it down. Deenan? Well, if I can, sorry for jumping in, but, uh, uh, but uh, I think it's going to be very difficult in the absence of a, a vaccine that is taken by the vast majority of the population is a, and is 100% efficacious. In the absence of that, of course, the characteristics of this virus, where maybe um, just less, less than 50% of transmissions may occur before symptoms start, where there's variability, where maybe 50% of the population who get the infection may be asymptomatic or so mildly symptomatic that they wouldn't notice in those sort of circumstances, I think is going to be very difficult to eliminate the virus from the population. Yeah, just can I just add, there was a paper today from the University of Minnesota, which uh, was just doing different scenarios, but it reckoned that the epidemic would probably last in many countries 18 to 24 months. And so then we just need to have different strategies, but they're not advocating lockdown but just different ways of um, dealing with it. So I thought that that's an interesting uh, paper and I don't know whether anybody else has seen that one from the University of Minnesota. Any comments? I've got Gabriel and uh, Zubeda. Thank, uh, thank you. I, there's one item I wanted to raise, please, if I may, and in the context of uh, uh, going forward and protecting ourselves. And uh, it's very relevant to the discussion about whether the virus will go away or not. And, and that is about border controls and port health mm. issues. Um, and I think this is really interesting because there are countries that appear to have taken major advantage of their island status, like New Zealand and uh, Taiwan, or virtual island status like South Korea and have very successfully dealt with uh, the virus. Uh, and here we are sitting uh, in, in, uh, in Britain, uh, adjacent to Ireland, uh, two, two islands with a, uh, an opportunity to take maximum advantage of that uh, island status. And it seems to me that that has not entered into discussion uh, to any significant extent. Uh, according to the Pew Institute in the US, uh, nine out of 10 of the world's population live in countries where there are border controls in place on public health grounds in respect of this, this virus. Uh, yet Britain and Ireland maintain their open borders policy. Uh, and that seems to me, as we go into a situation where we're thinking of lifting restrictions, places us in sudden jeopardy. Looking at the experience of China and the experience of uh, South Korea, when they have got down uh, to zero cases of domestic uh, transmission, they are still getting cases of, uh, from imported cases, from people, particularly citizens of their own countries, uh, returning to, to uh, the relevant country. And uh, it seems to me that the issue of uh, port health is extraordinarily important. After all, that's taking us back to uh, classical public health strategies and the classical response to the arrival of dangerous pathogens on our shores. Um, and therefore, uh, I would strongly suggest that uh, uh, we look at the issue of port health and what might be done in future and uh, looking at the experience from other countries uh, and the contribution that improving and tightening our port health to, to make use of this island advantage uh, uh, to, to explore how, how, what a contribution that could make. And I think that needs to be done on uh, a both island approach and certainly in Ireland, an all island approach. And there is work that is needed to harmonize uh, the situation. For example, in, uh, in the UK, including the north of Ireland, uh, the, the standard recommendation in terms of isolation in many cases is for seven days. Uh, just across the bridge from the UK, just across the river, uh, to, into County Donegal in the Republic of Ireland, the recommendation is 14 days. And this, uh, in terms of going forward, seems to me to be nonsensical and that there should be an attempt at getting a consensus 
and uh, there is plenty of evidence around about now uh, about uh, length of uh, uh, transmissibility of the virus and uh, recovery times, etc. And we should be looking, I think, at this issue of port health and how we can prevent cases coming in whilst facilitating uh, transport of goods uh, across, across, because we need to import food uh, and uh, uh, that's an absolute requirement. But we should be looking at our, our ports, our airports, and our uh, uh, Euro tunnel um, stops, train stops, from the point of view of what port health uh, regulations and what port health uh, choices we've got in terms of protecting us from importing cases as we get down to a small number of cases ourselves. Does anyone, Zubeda, I'm going to come to you in a moment, but does anyone have a comment on the seven versus 14 days? Alison P. Well, just to that uh, a group of us wrote to the Secretary of State um, to ask him why he wasn't following WHO guidance on the 14 days, because it's highly likely that people are returning to work too early and maybe transmitting the virus. So there's very clear WHO guidance and we are not adhering to their guidance. And there is no, uh, the reply was this was based on their scientific evidence, but they best science advice, but they didn't provide us with the basis for that or the studies that underpinned that. So that's another big disappointment. And um, we have put the web, that letter and the government's reply is actually on my website if anybody wants to see it. But my own view is that it should be 14 days at least. And actually in China, they're suggesting for some of their people, it's a much longer period because of the evidence that you might be transmitting uh, the virus for you know, shedding the virus for longer. But again, Dile might have, um, might have a view on that as our virologist. Virologist view. So let, let me just quickly come in and say, in Greece, needless to say, it is 14 days and the Greeks have allowed all Greek citizens to go back to Greece, uh, including the 16,000 students from Britain. And they are put into hotels for two weeks in isolation before they're allowed to join their families. And I guess that's the situation in, uh, in Northern, in Ire as well. No. No, it's not. No, I, no, I'm afraid. I'm afraid uh, it isn't. And uh, as as you know, people can fly in very uh, easily into Ireland, uh, transiting via uh, the US. And people are in the in the Republic of Ireland. People are are greeted, and there is a, a, a rudimentary public health uh, control there, but nothing like the sort of. Uh, 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 measures, I think, that are, are being uh, used with great success elsewhere. And the border, of course, between the north and south of Ireland is entirely porous as well. So I think those issues really do require uh, further explanation and uh, exploration. Thank you. Excellent. Zubeda, you want to come in? Um, yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of tangentially linked, which is, um, of course, we know, for instance, that um, COVID-19 has hit ethnic minorities um, disproportionately harder than other groups. We also know from recent data that um, uh, COVID-19 is hitting deprived areas much harder than non-deprived areas. Now, to a great extent, none of that is surprising given what we know about the research um, and how poverty and deprivation and overcrowding and so on is highly correlated to poorer health. But I do think there is a recommendation to be made to government about that analysis. A lot of the analysis in relation to ethnic minority groups and what are the contributing factors to um, ethnic minorities disproportionately bearing the brunt of COVID-19 and why it's happening in deprived areas has come from outside of government. I mean, the government have constantly been on the back foot with this. They've been behind the curve. And I think at some point they need to get slightly ahead of the curve where they start to better understand 
why is it happening much more in deprived areas? Why is it happening among ethnic minorities? Now, of course, with ethnic minorities, they, the government now have a review. We haven't seen the terms of the reference of the review. And I think that needs to be raised because that is of concern because we don't know in the review whether they're just going to focus on biological um, aspects of race rather than the socio-cultural and socio-economic aspects of racial inequalities that are related to COVID-19. But in deprived areas, it clearly is transmitting at a much faster rate for all the obvious reasons, um, which is, you know, overcrowding, high population density, um, you know, people are being forced into work because they're much more, li they're living on the red line and so on. And I do think we need to make a recommendation to government about doing some quick analysis. And in terms of exit from lockdown, thinking about whether we need a much faster exit from lockdown in those areas where there are less green spaces, where there is overcrowding issues and so on. Thank you, Zaveda. Um, I've, I've got Alison P.O. next, but I, I just wonder whether I could bring in Kamlesh who wants to make a point on this. Kamlesh? In, in, yes, in, in terms of the, the BME populations that Zaveda is mentioning, it's much more complex than just looking at the socioeconomic and cultural aspects. They're definitely part of it. But some of our work and others' work is showing that may be also related to other conditions, chronic conditions that these people have. Yes. So yes. What's, what's been shown is that uh, the people who are having severe disease and dying from it are more likely to have cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes. These are all yes. factors that are at higher prevalence in these uh, populations. So I think that is very, very difficult to distangle very easily. Uh, in terms of uh, the research elements, um, we've just had a, a phone call just now. NIHR, uh, uh, National Institute for Health Research, have just got a call out to look at why minority ethnic populations are at increased risk and they are uh, going to be funding a number of projects. And this will be on aspects of the medical models and also the socioeconomic and cultural aspects as well. So we really welcome that. Thank you very uh, much. Cam Kamlesh, do you mind if I come back to you about that? Can I ask, because of course one of the most extraordinary things about, um, or actually tragic things about um, the high proportions of critical illness and deaths among ethnic minorities in relation to COVID-19 is the slightly younger age of, of those groups, or actually yeah. much younger age, which given their age, you would expect far fewer deaths yeah. and far fewer critical illness. Is, is that not right? Not right, no. But, um, what we've seen, and um, this is from data from colleagues who are working in intensive care, is that they're coming in probably five to ten years younger. Mm. Uh, but we also know that all of these chronic conditions that are mentioned, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, they occur at a younger age in this population as well. Thank you, that's very helpful. Alison Pollock. Thank you. Um, I just want to build on uh, what Gabriel was talking about, about how do we get out of the lockdown really, and uh, the idea of travel restrictions and port control controls, which have always been part of infectious disease control. There's nothing new there, except we stopped doing it. and We're still not doing it in the UK. We haven't got quarantine measures in, people can walk in and out, and there's no contact tracing or checking up. But I also want to bring back, you raised, uh, Dave, the issue of track and trace. Now, if we think about it, I'm going back to the analogy um, that we had in, in our introduction, I think from Carl, who talked about um, fires burning really, firecrackers and fires. But if you think about it, across the country, we've got thousands of outbreaks or little fires burning at different stages and, and different sizes. You would not call the, uh, if you were living in Herefordshire or Hertfordshire, you would not ask Westminster to send their fire brigade. You would want to have locally responsive fire brigade teams. And then you would have third capacity. If the fire gets out of control, you would draw on extra support from neighboring teams and you would build that up. That's been really the principle of public health. You put your structures in your local health bodies or your local health authorities, and you build that capacity. But that also needs real-time data. 
Now, public health, the directors of public health England, directors of public health in local authorities are saying the government is determined to centralize this. They're determined to build a parallel and private system that's centralizing everything. We are not getting access to the local real time data we need. They're not giving us the resources. And so what we need to have in every area is a return to building the local community capacity and services. And that includes hospitals and local areas, the pathology labs and universities and the NHS that are not being fragmented by the purchaser provider split. It means putting back the testing locally and the capacity to do the testing, as well as the contact tracing and building the teams locally. That needs huge resource, public health resource, but not nearly as much as the amount that we've just wasted on ventilators that don't work, on tests that don't buy, tests that don't work from China and the, even the Nightingale hospitals. What we need is community monitoring and community resource, drawing on all the different parts of the health system, which have been completely fragmented by the Health and Social Care Act 2012. So public health sits in local authorities, but it has no power to do communicable disease control. And then the bit of communicable disease that sat in public health was moved out into Public Health England, but they only operate through nine regional centers. They cannot operate at the level of the district authority. And that's where you need the action to be in local health bodies and local health authorities. And, and only in that way can you begin to lift the measures in, in local areas, because in many areas now, there are no cases or very few cases. So actually you could have the community involved in the local decision-making about how far you go with lifting some of the national measures locally. And then when you may need to adjust and put some more back in place. But this needs local responsiveness. It does not need the government, which is using NHS X, which is a new body, NHS X, to build a parallel system built on multiple multinational and corporate providers, as in their app and their testing and the data, and they're sucking it all up. We must have this locally and build the trust of our community. And that's how you do contact tracing and testing in public health. And you also have to know your community when you're doing this. Alison, what I'm drawing out of that in terms of advice is strengthen local communities, strengthen, strengthen healthcare uh, sectors in those areas. Perhaps mayors and local councils, cities coming into play in the entire process. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think Gabriel is very well equipped as a regional director of public health who's been up through the system to also comment on what's required. So I've, I've got Martin and then Gabriel coming in. I keep coming back to this point that we are a scientific advisory group. All yeah. of these issues about the political arrangements and, and so on are fine for later. These are things that are not going to get changed now. So what do we actually need to do now? Can I make three concrete suggestions. One, and each of them involved taking a blank sheet of paper and filling it in. On the first sheet of paper, we should have a clear list of the information that we want to know, which is about the zero prevalence, which is about the mortality, or the other things, and then have a strategy for getting that information, looking at what sources of data we will use to collect it. So what do we need to know? How can we find it out? That's the first one. The second issue that we haven't really talked about much, and it relates to a, a piece that we did with colleagues in the British Medical Journal recently, is to make sure that we bring all the different medical specialties together to really be sure that we actually know that we're getting the best treatment. This is a complex multi-system disease. And what some of the manifestations we talked about um, ethnic minority populations and so on. There may be biological factors, there are certainly social factors, but we actually need to make sure that the immunologists, the cardiologists, the respiratory physicians and everybody else uh, and the basic scientists are working together to be really clear that we know what this uh, condition is and how we actually optimize the treatment because I'm not sure that we've necessarily got everything right. And the third thing which touches on some of the points that Alison said, but you know we can't change it overnight, is to have a sheet of paper where we write out 
using a, a systems diagram, be clear of what we want to do in terms of testing and tracing, what all the functions are that are needed for that. Do we need a population register? Do we need a quality control system? Do we need a monitoring bit? And have all of those functions written down and then work out who can actually do them and who can do them best. Now that addresses the question of whether Deloitte is the right person to do it, people to do it, or whether the local government is. But at least we need to say, what are all the functions and how they interact? So three sheets of paper with those three things written down in them. And then I think we could move on from that. Martin, is it possible we could emerge with those three sheets of paper? And if so, could you lead on that? Well, I'm certainly happy to put the headings down, but uh, it, you know, it's not that simple, but I think that we no, can I know. start. I, sorry, I, I'm now going to Gabriel. I very much agree with, with Martin on, on those three headings, and I, I don't think it is simple. Uh, but it is absolutely correct that this has to be done. The data, I, I think we're in general agreement that uh, we need data specification and then a plan for uh, getting that data and, uh, and comparable data as well and being able to compare ourselves systematically with the experience of other countries. Uh, because I think one of the things that has been missing so far has been uh, the science of observation of uh, observing what is being done and what has happened as a result in other countries. And uh, I, I do feel very strongly that that, that is uh, something that should be corrected e even at this stage. In fact, at this stage, it will be extraordinarily valuable. The issue uh, of the, uh, the Martin's third piece of paper about uh, the tracing, contracting and setting out what, how it can be done is not a simple matter uh, where, uh, as he says, because, and that's, really why no one actually does know how it is going to be done, even though uh, there is a general consensus that we need to improve testing in the community. Uh, there still is an inadequate definition of that. And one of the problems about that, it, it's an English problem, I think. Uh, I think Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland are both in a better position because of uh, the smaller population and, uh, uh, and, and geography and, and infrastructure to be able to bring a rational approach to bear on the practical uh, science of delivering uh, services, in, the, in this sense, public health services to the population. Uh, England has uh, dismantled its regional structures. I used to be a regional director of public health and uh, sat in a government office for a region. And unfortunately, those are not there uh, for us anymore. So uh, there is a requirement to look at what structures are available to us to do this test going on for quite some time and possibly and hopefully spilling over into being able to deliver a rapid and effective uh, immunization program when there is a, a vaccine uh, available to us. Uh, and uh, those, those structures do are complex because of the lack of coterminosity uh, that often exists now between what is left. Uh, and it, but it does, it requires intelligent design and, and that is indeed a, a good function and it requires some, some degree of management science to be introduced uh, to make sure that it is going to function, uh, function uh, adequately. And it requires to be uh, performance monitored and per performance managed and all of those are no easy task but it does need to be done. Thank you. I just want to distinguish between where we are now and how we emerge from where we are now and then presumably when it's all blown over whether that's in one or two or three years time we will come back to lessons learned and i i think it's from the lessons learned that many of these uh, uh, proposals for example that alison pollock is talking about would really come into play but at the moment we've got to move on from where we are i'm not saying that that means we simply go with the facilities we have today we have to maximize how we can get those facilities up to deliver what is needed to be done anthony you're anxious i hate to interrupt but, um, to interrupt, but actually you know where we are now what, what the government is doing now determines where we're going to be in three years time which is why it's so very important we think about it now because the structures and systems really do matter and the government is making big choices at this moment about where it's going, for example, on NHSX, the high-tech app that's being rolled out. So government is making those choices without our involvement. 
And that will then, that will mean that three years down the line, it will be too late. So I suppose I disagree. We need to say where we need to be going now. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so so uh, I think I've got Anthony to come in. So yes, um, we are a scientific advisory group of experts, but I'd like to challenge the definition of science. I mean, one of the huge problems with the existing SAGE and the why we're here is because they ignored population science, public health science. It's all very well, you know, mathematical modeling is extremely important yeah, yeah. and virology and clinical academics. But the big problem is that to solve the immediate problem of find, trace, test, isolate, you setting up a parallel system is not going to work and it's not going to be sustainable. Yes, we can bring in maybe some private sector support to help with contact tracing, but it's got to plug into our local systems of primary care and it's got to plug into our local systems of public health, our district public health teams. And, and I've been slightly horrified because I've been doing more global stuff in the last few years to find how weak we've been on that. And, and I just think we're not tapping into the resources that we have. One other thing on community stuff, uh, I looked into, somebody alerted me actually to mutual aid in this country. And I looked up their website and there are something like nearly 5,000 groups up and running to support people around the world, uh, around the country. We know from, and I've been involved in community development research where you use groups to, uh, bring about change. And we've looked at big impacts on diabetes in, for example, Bangladeshi populations, where group uh, interventions are much more successful at reducing the prevalence of these underlying conditions than, than, than many other things. And the other issue, which is perhaps not in the immediate term, but in the medium term, is there was a report from, from Nesta called the Biomedical Bubble published two years ago, and they pointed out that when you look at all the research funds going into health, 94% are spent on drugs, clinical treatments, and bioscience. And 2% is spent on public health. And that's the mess that we find ourselves in now, that stuff that's community or population is constantly downgraded. And I've spoken to very senior public health people in this country um, who are actually appalled at what's been going on in the last couple of months. But they're, you know, because they're in jobs and they need grants and they need honours and all the rest of it, are not prepared to speak out about this because it's, it is difficult. I mean, it's easy for me because I'm, you know, I, if I get fired by UCL, I've got a pension, you know. But it is more difficult for a lot of people to say these things. And I've been bombarded by it really great messages from from juniors in the front line who are saying look we're the public health people we're trying to do stuff in our districts but we're actually having to volunteer and, and that's the final thing Seven hundred and fifty thousand people have volunteered to help this initiative and we should have mechanisms political mechanisms and local authority mechanisms to make use of those people because it can be incredibly valuable to support the collective effort as we go forward so but for f for fine trace isolate if we're going to get control of this and suppress it we have to work with our existing local services primary care and public health i'm just going to intervene to say how i define science I, I define it as ski NTI. I go back to the original definition from the Latin, which is knowledge, all of knowledge. It covers the whole range. And if you don't put that all together, I know you can make dreadful mistakes. So, uh, and of course, this is why we've got a good group of public health people uh, in front of me now. Um, I, I think the, the, the time is rolling on. Uh, I'm, I'm admiring everybody's capacity for sitting on and on, uh, but I, I do think I'd better push with the agenda. Um, and I'm wondering uh, whether Christina would like to come in. You sent in a comment, not actually on the agenda, about the impacts of severe COVID-19 disease on people, recovery and so on. Do you want to make a comment? Um Yes, yeah, so my comment was really about now that you know we've experienced the first surge, 
as of many countries, we can learn from it for planning for the next one. And um, one of those is beyond the need to adequately resource and staff intensive care services, <laughs> about what does that mean for hospitals and things that we've experienced that we can definitely improve next time are how do we manage oxygen, oxygen supplies to hospital at peak? How do we um, plan for things that happen like 30% of COVID patients in ICU develop kidney failure? And that has caused a real strain on actually the, the availability of renal fluids to support them. How do we manage the rehabilitation of people post ICU, which I know Alison's already spoken about. Um, it turns out, as the BMJ ran an article on it just two days ago, it's not just a respiratory disease that has other impacts on organs. How do we now plan and manage for that? And we've given ourselves, you know, probably several months to try and plan for that and how, how we plan our services. And I think this is the time to learn from that. Christina, I, think, I thank you because I think that is a point that we need to include in our report. I, I think uh, maybe it is not something you hear fully covered. Um, is there anything more to be said? Oh, sorry, I've got Zubeda. Um, sorry, um, actually it was uh, building on your point earlier, Dave, about, um, about how this isn't just about science. This isn't just about health. I mean, obviously COVID-19, like health health and saving lives is, is um, the, um, the priority, but the social and economic aspects of this is hugely critical. And thank you for bringing people like myself in. I mean, one of the things that we haven't discussed, um, but which is quite crucial, of course, is for instance, what happens during lockdown. Now we know from the women's sectors, from refuges and so on, that domestic violence has gone through the roof since lockdown. But what you don't have from government is that analysis, the social trade-offs of lockdown. Now I, I do understand, completely understand that, you know, lockdown has to happen for a reason. It has to be certain length and so on, but not to undertake any analysis, not to be on the front foot about the social trade-offs of lockdown, what it means for people to be in overcrowded housing, what it means for vulnerable women, for vulnerable children to be in that lockdown and what the government should be doing. Now they've put some money aside, you know, for domestic abuse services, but it's not going to be enough. And we already know from the women's sectors that actually there's going to be a lot more women asking, vulnerable women asking, for refuge services during the exit of lockdown rather than now. And the question will be, have government been putting aside enough refuge places and so on? So I do think that analysis needs to be done by government as well. And that's a priority. This isn't just about health. This is also about the social crisis as well. well I like that because you've come forward with a very clear piece of policy advice to meet this, uh, this crisis. Um, I don't know if I've, I've got Martin, uh, I don't know if D Deenan was next, but maybe not. Uh, maybe I've dealt with Deenan, in which case I've got Martin and then Kamlesh. Really just to follow on from what Zubeda has said, and uh, may, uh, maybe people aren't aware, we did actually publish an analysis of all of these wider social consequences in the British Medical Journal uh, this week which looks at the impact on areas like domestic abuse, on transport, on education, uh, on physical activity and so on. And there's a rather nice infographic pulled together by the editors in the British Medical Journal, which sets out all the interconnections and which I think, while maybe not comprehensive, does provide a good basis for thinking through all of those things, plus some references to literature and how they can be mitigated. I think it would be useful Zubeda, if you could work with Martin and just produce a short paragraph on this uh, as, as advice going forward. Um, uh, Dean, and yeah, I have got you. Yeah, just, just briefly on, on, on that. It is remarkable how little or, or how homogeneous the, um, uh, or how homogeneity has, has been assumed in all of the advice coming from government for instance, around how to deal within households. Now, clearly, um, and one of the issues with, reg with regard to disadvantaged and BAME um, uh, populations is perhaps different structures of households and how you actually quarantine within a household that's multi-generational. And yet there's been, ab I mean, uh, 
correct me if I'm wrong, but there's been absolutely nothing that has come out with regard to how to nuance that information. Um, and I think as we, I, I, again, as a recommendation, Dave, I think, you know, given that there's been an absence of, of, of that sort of recommendation, how do you actually quarantine? How, how, how is that done? How to, how to quarantine in, in a way as well that, uh, that minimizes the risk in terms of, of, of gender-based violence and, and, and so forth, mm -hmm. domestic violence? I think that would be, um, uh, given that we have an expertise within this group, it would be good. good yeah. I think, yes. sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I know we've only got 10 minutes. I think that's a really important issue. Yeah. And there are people here that could talk to the quarantine issue because it, it, I, I'm not clear whether there's a very coherent quarantine policy. Maybe Alison Martin and others know better, but um, we really need that because, you know, in China, they put sickest into hospitals, they put mildly into other facilities, they, they put uh, contacts into hotels. There are various policies, and I know that Carl's uh, modeling showed that actually we're promoting infection in households. I think you showed that, and that we weren't doing household social distancing at all well. So I'll well, finish. So, so can I just ask that Dean and Leeds on producing a paragraph on this? Oh, uh, as, as a virologist, I'm very happy to try. <laughs> But you, you've got some colleagues on this group who you could contact. Uh, Martin, you wanted to come in. I just wanted to pick up on Anthony's point and reintroduce the concept of institutional amplifiers. Uh, this goes back to, well, work that we and others have done in Russian prisoners with tuberculosis mining communities in sub-Saharan Africa with HIV and TB, where you bring people together at work prisons as well. Anywhere that brings people together can act as an amplifier of infection and then spread it out into the communities. We've seen it with cruise liners. We've seen it with care homes. And what worries me is I suspect that we're probably seeing it with hospitals too and going back to Anthony's point I think it's notable that in countries like Singapore after SARS they redesigned hospitals so they could have two pathways through the hospital which would keep the patients apart and that was a lesson that we didn't learn. I think this is also a very important point um, so each of you is now raising points that I'm now turning to and saying could you produce a short paragraph. Uh, I've got Alison Pitt, uh, two Alisons. Can I get it's just to add, it's just to add, just to add to um, what Dylan was saying about uh, the importance of general practitioners and community monitoring to go with contact tracing. Even if you don't have enough testing facilities, the clinical observation is really key. And the government again missed a trick because some countries are giving actually uh, community monitoring packs to people who are in isolating, that includes a thermometer and an oxygen saturation meter and even a blood pressure measurement. And as the, but they're accompanying that by um, following people up two or three times a day to check on their symptoms. And many of the people who have died at home in the community, we don't know the circumstances in which they've died and the extent to which community monitoring with community monitoring support would actually have enabled people to be looked after more at home and then when they need to go into hospital. So that's another area that the government could have spent money on. And all you do is you retake these packs back in and you recycle them. I just want to add to Zubeda's concerns. She's absolutely right. Not everybody can self-isolate. Not everybody can go into quarantine. And that's again why it's so important to know your local communities and that again depends on local public health and community groups and all the rest of it in having very good information. I mean, at the moment, the directors of public health aren't even getting seven digit postcodes to map where the cases are in their community. It's quite extraordinary, the data drought within uh, local authorities and for directors of public health. Thank you, Alison. And now I'm going to Alison Pittard. We'll have to change our names, won't we, Alison? Um, I, I think we have we have a, a fantastic opportunity here to reflect on from from the the health acute health sector perspective as to where we started off our experience so far and where we go going forward in terms of how we manage COVID and non-COVID cases within hospitals and make sure that we remain resilient. And I think that the Look, looking at how we can perhaps transform services in terms of moving um, things around so we can we can uh, 
take the pressure off certain areas that may be under excess pressure if we have more peaks in in demand in in the coming months and, and years so so i think looking at rather than reinventing the wheel and, and taking on new pieces of work is looking at work that's already underway or being looked at being implemented and trying to fast track that because they're the sort of things where all the work has, has already been done it's waiting to be either published or waiting for a work stream to finish and that would be a quick fix that would actually um give some resilience to the acute care sector thank you very much i i'm seeing a pause with no hands up so i'm going to move to um the next can i, can I just oh. just if we're going for it's Kamlish here yes Kamlish. Uh, yeah, just for recommendations we, we're going we're talking about recommendations about population level about screening about um, post discharge of patients but we mustn't forget our well-being of our workforce as well and i think that's an important recommendation to make um data that came oh, from Kamlish. What, what recommendation do we make about the, uh, the well-being of the workforce in hospitals? So the data that came out from Wuhan showed that 50% of the workforce had depression, anxiety, post-traumatic distress syndrome once they came out of this. And I think we mustn't forget that and prepare for that, and manage that as appropriately. We need to prepare for that now and for the short and medium term as well. Thank you. And again, I don't I'd like to add to that social care, and this I, I know I said it earlier, but the importance that many, the 1.6 million social care workers, a quarter of them are on zero hour contracts, they've got no statutory sick pay, there really needs to be a revolution in social care. I mean, I've argued for a national health and social care service, and there's quite a movement for that. And I think that needs to be something that the government needs to seriously uh, think about and take into account, especially if it's going to avoid more deaths in nursing homes. Thank you, Alison. I'm going to back to Gabriel Scully. I absolutely agree with the importance of psychological well-being as we move forward with this crisis. And we can look at examples that we have had in the, in the fairly recent past in this country. I know from my work as a regional director of public health, when I was very much involved in the foot and mouth outbreak, because uh, there were public health aspects to the disposal of the, the carcass load, and, and various other uh, issues. Um, and being regional director of public health of the southwest of England, which was so badly hit by that, there were enormous problems of uh, mental health issues amongst the farming community yes. uh, in the areas. Yes. Uh, uh, aff affected people who lost their livelihoods, uh, their herds built up uh, over decades, extremely important. And also people who were involved in the tourism industry uh, who, who lost their businesses as well because of that. And those uh, problems continued for some, some time. Uh, so we have got good examples of uh, some of the issues. And I think there will also be uh, issues of uh, human health arising from the effects of the lockdown specifically. Uh, I, I, I would expect agoraphobia, for example, and I would be um, expecting uh, obsessive compulsive disorders to be magnified. So I, I think a whole psychological strand of uh, uh, work going forward based on our knowledge of what has happened is very important. And staff, extremely important. Uh, to go back, sorry, to foot and mouth again, but uh, knowing of, of the problems of post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, uh, uh, traumatic disorders amongst both the farmers and indeed some of the professional staff who were involved in that whole exercise, it, it's, it's quite clear that we are going to have big problems and they're the sort of problems we should be preparing for now. Thank you for yeah. saying that, David. Sorry, Zach here. Can I, I, Dave, sorry, Zach here. Can I interrupt quickly? Yeah. A couple of people have expressed in the chat that they need to leave now. Perhaps you could take a moment to allow those to, who need to go to go. Thank you. Who, who has to leave now? It's going to be Martin and Kamlesh and Zubaida, Zubaida, sorry. And can I can I take you in perhaps that order, uh, Martin? Any final comments before you have to leave us? No, I think I've made my point. So I think that the three pages, say, you know, what do we need to know? 
together all the clinical aspects so we make sure that we've got the treatment right and having a whole systems approach to all the things we want to do in terms of, con of tracing and testing if we had those I think that would be a concrete outcome and I think there are lots of other issues but I suspect that they're going to have to be dealt with further down the track we really do need to remember that when we're thinking about proposing major legislative change nothing is going to happen in the foreseeable future for all sorts of reasons. So it's just not on the table. We may want to think about it, dream about it, whatever, but it's not going to happen. Thank you. Very important. And thank you for your contribution, Martin. Actually, I disagree with that, Martin. I think things happen if there's enough political will and enough political movement. And if people really want to see change, it can happen. And October might be a good period for having new legislation for the NHS or health and social care. So I completely disagree with that, Martin. Okay. This is where, of course, disagreement is allowed. Can I come in with uh, Cam Lash? No, I'll just say thank you very much. Really enjoyed it. And thank you for making me part of this. Thank you for joining us. It's been really valuable. Zubeda. Um, yes, thank you. I, I want to echo that as well. It's been incredibly valuable and I feel incredibly privileged to be part of this group. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to sort of reiterate two very important points. One is, is that I want to go back to the fact that, you know, right now, right now, the government need to think much more about an economic safety net for vulnerable groups. Um, those are the groups at the, at the brink of poverty who don't fall neatly into employees or self-employed. Um, and even if they apply for universal credit, there are big constraints because there's simply not enough money there. And that needs to be ramped up, including child benefit. So that's the first uh, recommendation that I really would like to make. The second one, I think, is, is that the government needs to scrap the no recourse to public funds. That is trapping so many people. Those are people who, I don't know if you know, but basically if they don't have leave to remain or they have limited leave to remain, they can work. Um, they can't access any, any public funds. They can't access any benefits. They can't access universal credit, you know, council tax rebates or anything. They can't access any of that. And, and there are lots of groups. Sorry? Nor can they leave the country. Yeah, <laughs> nor can they leave the country. And so those groups are extremely vulnerable and the government needs to scrap that right now. So I'm just focusing on two recommendations that I'd like to put forward. But thank you for having me. Thank you, uh, all three of you. It, uh, it has been, I think, uh, quite enlightening. I'm very privileged to be chairing this group. And Christina. Yeah, sorry, I, I need to leave as well just to say one more thing. Um, firstly, thank you for inviting me. And secondly, that although we need to clearly work to support critical care and acute care, we need to prevent. And so that's why I think tracing and tracking and quarantine is so important. Um, and really protect also the key workers who have public facing every day. So not just healthcare staff or care home staff, but shop workers, bus drivers, anyone who interacts a lot with the public need to be protected. Um, and we need to think about our strategies to achieve that. Okay, thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, could, can you hear me? Yeah. Christina. Could I ask? No, no sorry, that's this, uh, yes. um, no, no, I'm Anthony, you. Anthony, you're coming in. Yeah, um, can I ask Carla a question? Uh, can you hear I me? Anthony, can I just, given that the three, uh, uh, given that there's only Alison uh, as a woman left here, oh, Alison Pollock still, I thought Alison Pollock, uh, Alison P. Uh, Pollock, are you stay, staying with? Okay, sorry, I thought. You thought we'd be a man or? I thought the women were going and then there was still the issue of who, which woman would join you at a press conference, David. I didn't want people to have disappeared by yes. the time you made I that. I, I think we can contact people by email. Uh, I, Zach, I don't know if you want to come in here. How are we going to contact people let's, for the press? Let's wrap things up as you guys carry on. Don't worry about that. We'll sort it afterwards. That's that will be sorted. So don't worry. Okay. Thank you, um, Anthony. You were making a point. I, I was just going to ask Carl um, if we assume that let's say 10% of the population have been effectively susceptible. 
all right, or, or even 15%. And let's assume that the herd immunity is not that good. Let's say that, you know, only about, we can only rely on a fairly short spell. Let's be a bit pessimistic. It may be wrong. What, Christ, what advice would you give to the government now and which criteria would you most look at about lifting the lockdown? There's going to be increasing pressure. We've done, what, six weeks, is it? Six weeks so far. Um, China and a lot of these others lifted the, the quieter parts at about seven or eight weeks. And Wuhan, I think, was at about 11 weeks. And we may be, London, you know, maybe looking at that experience, we need to go for another three or four weeks in places like that if we're going to really lock down or maybe not. Would you go on R0? Would you go on new cases? Or would you, at, you know, bearing in mind a more pessimistic scenario of how many have been covered and risks of second surge, how would you advise that? Or is that an impossible question? I think it's a great, it's a technical and very pragmatic question, and I think has some clear answers. So, first of all, anything that you're advising to be done has to be demonstrably doable, and that has to be evidence-based. So you need to have a generative model of what has happened so far that includes societal, governmental, institutional healthcare responses. Um, and then search for the evidence or the models that have the greatest evidence. And it, it looks as though it's a fairly simple strategy, uh, sorry, policy. <laughs> um, I, I think we should reiterate your big point about the, sort of the short and the long term, the WHO and the, um, and the um, um, governmental um, criteria. Um, the kind of policy that seems to explain what countries are actually doing and once you've got one generative model you can actually assimilate data from China and actually thinking more specifically about the United States uh, and um, those data actually speak to something that you were talking about before about um, quarantining and leveraging the fact that we are insular. In fact the United States presents a very interesting problem in terms of transport of people who could potentially reinfect each other from a state that is infected to a state that is not infected. And I was amazed by the number of people that um, on a daily basis move from one state to another. It's about, you know, between 0.5 and 1%. So there's a big question there about do you lock down between state movement? Um, and also speaking to this, you know, I think uh, an issue which I wasn't aware of, and I'm, I'm, I, I found the Allison's plural treatment of it very compelling. Uh, and I just say, if anybody's going to go and talk about this, I, I think those two, you know, are the, the kind of face I would find convincing um, and, and, and I repeat compelling. Anyway, uh, the, the, but the the issue of local um, responses and this notion of the way that you model society's response in mathematically, it is a model of self-organization and, it, and it, you can ask, you know, does a model where you um, empower statewide or local um, responses have more evidence or produce better outcomes than if you have a federal, national, centralized response. And the evidence to ha at hand to date from um, collecting data from specific states on new cases and um, new deaths suggests that a local statewide response is much better than a federal response. So it's not Trump who decides, it's the, the local governor. So if you just roll out, project the model under a very simple social distancing policy that says that um, there exists a threshold below which you move from an amber state of social distancing to a complete lockdown, a red state of social distancing. If that exists, what is, what is um, that threshold as estimated from the data for each country? And when you do that, it's about 3% for the UK. Interestingly, and um, this follows on from um, the task you set us last weekend, Anthony. Uh, so we didn't do a comparative analysis of South Korea, but we did compare Germany and England. And it's very interesting. You, you think that um, Germany, in virtue of its commitment and foresight in terms of testing and tracking and rigorous adherence to, to social distancing, would be 
that would be the explanation for um, the relatively low death rate. In fact, it's not. In fact, the evidence suggests England, the UK, has got that parameter slightly lower. So they're slightly more allergic to the prevalence of infection in the community, which suggests that we're gonna come out of lockdown later, as you say, about two to three weeks later than we would have done had we been Germany. Um, so the question, what should that criterion be? be? You've gotta move forward or backwards in time. So it is, you, you choose the thing that preempts what's going to happen in two weeks' time. So this is like um, a control theoretic problem. If you want to control some quantity, some outcome, say deaths, for example, or demands on critical care, that, it, that is an evolving dynamic process, then you, uh, the, the control theoretic approach is to go back to the first indicators of that. So it's not the outcomes, the deaths. It's not even um, the number of new cases as identified by swabs. Uh, but if you can use the model to estimate the prevalence of infection, which is, if you like, the starter event, then that's the criteria. And that's what we've been using to, to actually model differential responses, both in comparative analyses between countries, but also in terms of evaluating different policies that could be adapted in, in the future. So it comes back to where we started in terms of, you know, having a well-defined, crisp, transparent, quantitative policy that an engineer would understand. And if an engineer would understand it, then the general public will understand it. And I think a lot of the uncertainty then will, 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 you know, we are, will, be, will be resolved. Does that cover your... Basically, you're suggesting from your models that local government responses are going to be better than something planned at the centre. Yeah. So if you take that model, so if you define the self-organised adaptive it's very much like a thermostat you know you, you put in place a process that is comes part of the epi epidemiology itself so you uh, don't let me forget i want to make a comment about r0 um, which i think technically is an important comment to make um but if you if if, if you actually put that into the um in, into the model itself then you can estimate this uh, this parameter and you can start to ask well is this parameter best driven by local estimates of prevalence? Is it best driven by primary care or does it have to be centralized or is it best driven by an app or, uh, knowing where, how that app harvests the data and the geographical fine grainness of it? So all these become basically hypotheses about this policy is better versus that policy. Once you have a hypothesis, then you can look for the evidence for that hypothesis relative to another hypothesis in communities that have already undergone this. So coming back to, I think, Gabriel, Gabriel's point earlier on, that, learning from what other countries have already done literally or practically simply becomes evaluating for the evidence for this policy hypothesis relative to that hypo policy hypothesis um, given the data from those countries and then building those into prospective models that, we're, that um, we can apply to our own data given that we're a few weeks or month, a months behind. The R0 is interesting. Um, R0 is completely irrelevant. R0 is the basic reproduction rate, uh, ratio for a susceptible population. That's completely irrelevant in terms of um, predicting what will happen if we relax lockdown now. What we need is the effective reproduction ratio, which is just R. And the difference is that R pertains to the actual community, the population at hand, how they will respond to it, how your neighbor will respond to it tomorrow. It's got nothing to do with some idealized susceptible population. So, in fact, R0 is, is R, as name says on the tin, it's R at the beginning of time, at time zero. What we need to know is what is R now. And my, um, so, you know, the maths as I read it actually puts R very, very, very small and has to be small while, while, we're, while we're in lockdown. The other thing is it's not a biological constant. It's not, it's not a physical thing that causes people to get infected and symptomatic. It's a, a statistical summary of a long-term process or where you are in some, in some curve. So I if anyone's actually using R0, first of all, they're using the wrong statistic. And second, I, 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 I wonder whether the media's propensity to cast things and explanations in terms of R, the reproductive ratio, and indeed some people's modeling initiatives is the right thing to do. What you need to do is to model what causes the R. How long? are you how many people are you in contact with 
at home? How effective is your social distancing? What's the transmission strength? Does it depend on temperature? Is it going to couple to seasonal flu? Is it going to cross all of the, the actual medical, societal, and practical aspects of you know, what we actually do? These are the proper parameters of the model, not, not, not R. Carl, I think that's exceptionally valuable. Uh, I'm going to point to Carl and perhaps Anthony to distill something out of that as a recommendation. Uh, I just think it was critically important. Um, I, I have noticed, I think Alison Pittard has had her hand up for a long time. I just wanted to echo what Carl had said and sort of put it into the acute healthcare perspective. I think if, if there's local control, um, then there's a feeling of ownership, ownership and you're much more likely to get buy-in. Um, and I think that is really important going forward. Um, and, and, I th and I think the rag rating of, of um, situations is really useful. And, and as an example, we, the, the faculty, collaborated with the College, Royal College of Anaesthetists to try and look at how we can start to reintroduce um, some um, operations and, and things. But, and we've, we've had to sort of develop an evidence base um, but what we don't want to do is have a top-down approach because every every hospital around the country is in a very different place depending on on the geography, um, and and so what we've established is red, amber, and green situations, which will then allow individual hospitals to decide where they are in that rating, which will then give them the um, the control over when to start reinstituting things, and I, and I do think that element of ownership and control. Is really important. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I just wondered if I could insert a comment after Gabriel's comments on the foot and mouth disease epidemic when I was effectively in the driving seat on managing that. Um, in, in my work, I focused very solidly on getting the epidemic over as quickly as possible with the neat, least number of animals culled. And in that process, completely took my eye off what we were doing to farmers. Uh, it, it was only after it was all under control that I learned about the large number of suicides amongst farmers uh, and what the impact was on, on the families in the farming uh, communities. So there's a lesson learned from keeping an eye on two elements of the thing without taking that into account. I, I've got Dinan keen to come in and then I've got Alison Pollock. Um, thanks, Dave. Uh, so yeah, no, Carl, it, really, really interesting. And um, I'm trying to pull together these direct and indirect effects of, um, of the pandemic, as we've talked about. Um, uh, the obvious indirect ones are the, the excess mortality for non-COVID related disease, right all the data are coming out and will come out over, over time but also a whole range of other um, 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 you know psychological effects and and I guess uh, Carl in in the model you're using almost like as an endpoint the elimination of the infection and, and and I wonder if you use something like qualies as an as an you know as an endpoint or the cost per you know, and then which says something more global around you know the health of the pop the broader health of the population which obviously takes into account not only these indirect ways but also the way in which we respond so for instance we'd assume that a locality based you know um, um, a re response to the release of the lockdown will take away some of the pressure from more acute care and so forth and whether it's possible to then you know, modify the model to, to, to talk in those more global ways. Um, and I think that would be, a again, that would speak to what is the sustainable and the best for the health of the population, rather than the, the as, as Dave, David said, you know, just the narrow, let's eliminate the infection. Yes, um, some excellent points there. Um, so one concept um, 
I think is useful to bear in mind is the notion of this um, notion of an endemic equilibrium. So the end point that we're talking about mathematically is not the elimination. I think there was a conversation between Dave and, and Anthony earlier on. Um, you know, is it ever going to be the case that the virus goes away? So just mathematically in the models, that's not the end point. The end point is literally um, the steady state that the system ends up in, in an endemic equilibrium. Um, so for example, if you ignore um, seasonal variations and you assume that we're going to lose immunity on a personal basis with the time constants of 30, two months, then the, the um, endemic equilibrium for the UK would be a, between say 10 and 40 deaths per day of COVID, which you know, is much less than the number of people who are killed by traffic accidents, for example. So that would, that would be the point where it's not a big thing anymore. You're, you're more likely to get killed crossing the road and we don't want to develop vaccines against cars and we don't want to have social distancing from our, from our vehicles or our trains. Um, so that's the kind of endpoint one's 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 going for. The, the, the question about can you put these um, the more sorry, the broader issues into the model and thereby start to elaborate um, high dimensional cost functions that try to sort of accommodate different agendas and, and the sort of the primary, secondary, and tertiary consequences and try to differentially weight them. That's an excellent point. Yes, absolutely. You, you, you know, this is not um, my direct field of expertise, but you know, there are models like the GLEAM model in the United States that has exceedingly detailed, fine-grained, spatial, temporal gridding of what could happen, putting a lot of information about sort of translocation between airports. Um, the models that I've been working with actually have days lost uh, you know, from work as part of this. So you know, the, I think the sort of standback comment here is that the kinds of models that are being used to assimilate data in order to provide different ev evidence to different models or hypotheses. And I use that phrase deliberately because if you've got the right kind of model, you can use it to test hypotheses, ideas, heuristics, intuitions, um, recommendations. They all become hypotheses that in principle can be evaluated in terms of the evidence for that hypothesis in the data, in the, in the data to hand. Um, and that means you need to have a modeling initiative that can handle those sorts of data. So you need to have modeling that goes beyond the SEIR models and actually has the number of days you are here. And if you are here, what implication does that have for load on primary care? And, and you'll put, so you put all of these factors into the model, um, which takes us beyond epidemiological modeling in and of itself and becomes much more like an economics model. But as I think three, at least three people have said it in one way or another. You're outside the silo of a virologist, of an epidemiologist, of a neuroscientist, of a psychologist. You've got to take everything that matters into account. Otherwise, you know, your hypothesis, and first of all, they're not being informed by all the data at hand, but more importantly, they're not speaking to the imperatives that matter. And then there's a deeper question is, which imperatives matter? At the moment, we've eluded that problem simply by saying, this is how countries appear to behave. So I could tell you how New York values a human life against a day lost at work. I can work that out yes. on the basis of, this is how they have responded. So you can do something called reverse reinforcement learning. So you can work out what v relative value do they put on the human life relative to a day lost at work on the basis of their behavior. Clearly, one's not going to do that because it would be um, ungentlemanly. Um, yeah, but a very interesting outcome of that analysis. <laughs> yes, um, but it does speak to the question then, of, you, know, you, you know, how you are going to, what are you going to define as being an optimal outcome? So operationally, it's just the endemic equilibrium. Um, but of course, there are different ways of getting there. And then, and then it be, I presume, it then comes down to consensus amongst groups like this in terms of the relative costs that you might want to consider in terms of what is a good and what is a bad outcome. I think we would all agree, wouldn't we, that a systemic approach to a problem like this is absolutely vital, mm. critical to get the right players in uh, to provide the, uh, the advice for action. I, I sense that we're all agreeing that we need to see that there's much more uh, control given
to local communities to manage this uh, uh, epidemic. Um, I, I, think, I think that has come through what many of you have been saying. Um, I'm just trying to draw some general conclusions out before we all drop with exhaustion. Um, uh, and I, I suppose I do just want to throw in for a moment, I don't want to spend time on this, the question of vaccines. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it obviously would help enormously if there was a rapid evolution of vaccines, if the manufacturing capacity was built up in advance of the development of the first vaccine so that it can be rolled out quickly. But the, the question is, it, is it possible that the system is relying too much on the emergence of a vaccine in this way? Yes, Dina. Um, uh, uh, excellent question. And um, I think it's, it's self-evident that all the years of pandemic planning that there's been since MERS, and uh, there's been a very, at a global level, there's been um, a quite an impressive co co coalition of of policymakers, funders, and so forth. It, it seems to me the biggest advance that that has provided is on speeding up va new vaccine development, rather than, for instance, providing the UK or many other countries with an, a public health infrastructure that will work. So that's not that's not um, denigrating the vaccine issue. I'm saying that that's one of the I think one of the successes given how quickly vaccines have, have come. But I think an implication of that historical um, um, focus on vaccines as the way out, and many eminent people, um, you know, Jeremy Farrar, a very good colleague and, and, and very respected uh, member, global health leader, has himself said, it's the science that will lead us out of this, it's the vaccine. Um, and and I, I worry about that. Um, I worry as well because when a scientist stands up in the press and says, and, and there's a lot of press about this, that a vaccine will be ready in September, that will say something to the scientist, you know, who is the first in human study. It does not mean when we're all going to go to our primary care centers and get our jab. You know, that, that's me. So I, I do fear, as I said earlier, I do fear um, that we are, um, that the vaccine is the backdrop to literally every conversation government is having at the moment is, you know, and, and so it would be good if this group could, however much I, I, I'm looking forward to good vaccines and many different uh, uh, candidates, I do think we need to consider what would be the situation for a partially effective vaccine, a vaccine that maybe didn't have full uptake, some safety profile issue that maybe came out after the very rapid licensing, all of those things that could happen that could have a huge adverse effect on how behavior is. And we're all familiar about the, the politicization of immunization and, and so on. So of course, that's also their indirect cost. So that's a, a summary of my thoughts. Uh, you know, it, it's great that, you know, I, I'd love us to all feel as a, we're going to depend on the vaccine. I just feel that we should maybe consider, you know, what if vaccine is not as effective as we're hoping and, and how we deal with that. Thank you, Dina. And I think Gabriel wanted to come in. Yeah, I, I agree with that so much. Uh, I, I, I get a little bit dismayed when I see the uh, abounding uh, enthusiasm for the vaccine as the solution to all our, our problems. Uh, and I, I worry about it a little bit when I, I read some of the stuff uh, that's begun to emerge. Uh, interestingly enough, I was looking at uh, the issue of uh, convalescent serum therapy uh, recently, and I was surprised to find that when they uh, started collecting the serum from people who had uh, been positive, tested positive, they'd find a significant proportion of those survivors of, uh, of the virus uh, who didn't really have antibodies uh, circulating and whose serum was of, of no, no value to them. So I, I, I think it'll be very interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, and uh, the public health, uh, practical public health response is to... Uh, whilst acknowledging and uh, being grateful for optimism, we should plan uh, 
for uh, the worst scenario, which would be that we don't have end up with an effective vaccine, certainly for several years. Uh, and that we have to rely on other methods to try and keep our communities operational and working and, and keeping people safe. And that means putting in place really good public health uh, measures and uh, practices at a local, uh, a regional and indeed at a government level. And uh, that means an alteration in the system, really. Thank you. I've is that the same point, Alison Pollock? Well, just to reinforce that uh, this, we have some very good vaccines that work, and the governments uh, were very concerned about immunization stopping in children. So that's another, you know, called damage of COVID because our health services aren't working, and we need to get them up and working again. And the only other point I'm going to make is that it's all very well have a vaccine uh, which may not be as effective as we want, but then there will be other pandemics, epidemics, other viruses, and corona may well mutate to another one. So I think all the points are we must plan to have a system that can cope the next time that we have another epidemic or the next wave of this epidemic. I couldn't agree more. I think that is a very important factor. So I, I'm afraid I'm going to throw one more thing at you, uh, which is, is the, the question of masks. Um, we face masks. We haven't really discussed that. I have noted that uh, as Greece emerges from its lockdown starting today, face masks will have to be worn by everybody outdoors and going shopping, etc. I note that when Austria introduced the uh, uh, regulation, legal process that everyone was required to wear face masks, the incidence seemed to drop. Uh, what what do people feel about face masks? Um, <laughs> actually, I'm probably the least qualified, and we've lost two of our people because I know that um, yes. Martin McKee had changed his mind after doing a review, and I think um, Susan's also done a lot of work on this. I'm sure Alison will have something to say. Mm. I mean, we know... Um, you know, you, you wear a, a mask to protect other people, and there's no doubt about that. But the question is, does it protect you if you're, you know, on a tube train or on a bus or something, or in a choir? Because we know that people singing or in schools can, you know, maybe spread it more effectively than we think. Um, I just have one thought, which I got from a very eminent public health person who told me, she said, this comes from your nose, washing your hands, yes, that's important, but you don't put a condom on your finger, which is a way of saying, cover your mouth. You know, I'm sitting in rural Yorkshire and I'll go out for a walk without a mask. But frankly, if I was in London, I would definitely wear some kind of covering on the tube or on a bus. Uh, and the evidence is not that strong, but it's absence of evidence rather than evidence of absence of effect, I think. But I might be wrong. I might be talking rubbish here. So, so we, we know that a lot of the evidence is obtained from the normal flu virus, and this is a very different beast. But I, I, I think given that we're not an expert group in this area, I may have asked the wrong question at the wrong moment, yeah. um, and maybe we should move yeah. on. Is yeah. there, is there any other point before we do uh, come to an end? Gabriel is saying absolutely not. <laughs> um, but I see Dina is going to raise a new point. All, all, I'm, all I want to say about masks is that while we've been on air, as it were, um, the Royal Society um, you know, group that's looking at a whole range have apparent have have I see issued some guidance on masks. So I'm looking forward to read what that eminent group of individuals have said. Good. I, I, I just want to say something to what Anthony said. He he mentioned choirs and masks. I'm not sure that a choir can sing when it's wearing masks. Can it? <laughs> or be heard. <laughs> or be heard. <laughs> Could I just uh, ask you, um, Dave, I think the, the R0, I really, and um, Carl's, uh, you know, I was thinking about this lies, three kinds of, um, three kinds of lies, lies, damp lies, and statistics, Mark Twain. 
And we've already covered the problem of the daily death, the daily toll of deaths and tests that the government's putting out and the need for official statistics and a statistician. But I'd add to that this whole R0. It's being used all the time on a daily basis by our you know, CMO, our CSO. And I really think it's something that is confusing for most people. And it would be really good to do something, you know, to put something out on this, Carl. I think it's really useful what you what you your explanation. Thank you. I agree with you, Alison. Absolutely. It would be quite important if we can get that distinction out in our report to government. And then I've got Gabriel with possibly the last comment. I don't know. Well, thank, thank you very much. I, I, I just had one final thought on, on masks, and that was we shouldn't uh, forget about people for whom the wearing of masks in uh, public causes problems. Uh, and for people with hearing disabilities uh, who rely upon being able to see people's mouths and their lips move, it really would be an enormous, uh, an enormous difficulty for them. Uh, but I, I, I'm, I, uh, I'm not an expert in this area and I look forward to seeing the consensus emerge. Uh, but finally, I just wanted to say what a pleasure it's been uh, to take part in this uh, excellent meeting. Uh, it has been uh, a rare privilege. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir David, for convening it. Uh, I look forward to working with uh, colleagues and helping to illuminate some of these really interesting issues uh, that we've touched on today. Thank you very much. Well, can I just finish by saying thank you to all of you. Um, Anthony helped me considerably yeah, in pulling this group together. Um, I, I think, uh, Carl, wonderful contribution. It was really so important to have you here. Dean and I think we just learned so much from you. And then, as was said, uh, the two Allisons together, you guys need to get together and produce, again, a short recommendation on the importance of care in the community in this process. So thank you so much. I, I always enjoy these because I come from outside your field and it's always a steep learning curve and I enjoyed it immensely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you.